Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our second FY 2023 residents budget hearing this evening. And though the pandemic has dominated many facets of our lives the last couple of years, our team has been working diligently to do one of their most important responsibilities, formulate a budget and make sure that it actually meets the needs of our county. As you know, the fiscal impacts and repercussions will be long term. However, we're going to continue to hear from our residents and work together to move forward. And your input is vital as we work to maintain our critical services and ensure that Howard County is strong moving forward. Please know that every comment and every testimony is being heard and considered and reviewed by our team. And your engagement and input in this process is critical. So thank you for participating tonight. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Safa Hira who will provide logistics on tonight's hearing and announce the names of those who are registered to testify this evening. Good evening. Before we begin hearing from you, we have a few logistical items to go through. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed. If you are unable to testify due to technical issues, we are also taking written testimony to ensure every voice is considered during the budget process. All testimony, written and oral, is considered by our team. Please send any written testimony to budgettestimony at howardcountymd.gov. Each person will have up to three minutes to testify, and those who represent an organization will have up to five. You will be called based upon the order of your, based upon the order of your registration. Everyone is currently muted to avoid background noises. When it is your turn to testify, you will be unmuted, and your name will be called so that you have the opportunity to be heard. All testimony will be audio only to minimize broadband issues and to ensure we can hear you clearly. Per tradition, we will begin our hearing tonight with the youngest among us, our students. First up, we have Alex Murphy, followed by Daria Willis. Alex? Alex, but I'm muted. Uh, testing? We can hear you. Okay. Hello, Dr. Ball. My name is Alex Murphy. I was a student in Howard County Public School Systems, but now I attend a private school for kids with dyslexia. I am speaking to you tonight to advocate for kids in your school system to get the same kind of help and support that I get at my current school, which I feel has allowed me to read and learn better. Here's why I feel I can read and learn better at my current school. First, they have all their teachers trained in structured literacy and know how to teach kids with dyslexia. Second, we do a lot of hands-on learning. This helps because some kids learn in other ways than just writing things down. For example, my math teacher gave us chips of two different colors to represent negative and positive numbers. Using chips allowed us to touch and manipulate the numbers rather than just being written on paper. Third, we have small class sizes so the teachers can take time needed to help us when we need extra help. If I was still in Howard County systems, I don't think I would be able to read this speech as well as I do now. I would like to ask that you help our your special educators and reading specialists. Currently, one reading specialist specialist helps about 45 to 60 students. I don't see how the reading specialists can best meet the needs of students when they are responsible for helping that many students. HCPSS is asking for an increase in the budget to make the number more like one reading specialist to 35 students. Special educators and reading specialists are helping the kids like me that need things taught in a different way. Please protect the funding that Dr. Martirano has budgeted for more special educators and reading specialists. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Dr. Daria Willis, followed by Christopher Marasco. Sorry. Good evening. Daria's been unmuted. All right, thank you. Okay. Good evening. Yep. All 
All right, good evening, County Executive Ball, Mr. Robbins and Dr. Sun. I am Dr. Daria Willis, president of Howard Community College. It is my distinct pleasure to be here for the first time to speak to you about the talented and hardworking employees of HCC and why they deserve your support in the fiscal year 2023 operating budget. Since starting, I have been touched by the dedication of our employees who live by the mission of providing pathways to success in everything they do. And wherever I turn, I hear stories of the impact our faculty and staff make in the lives of our students. Throughout the pandemic, even at its worst, facility staff were on campus, keeping the buildings clean and safe and operational. The IT team was there handing out computers and maintaining equipment to ensure every student could access technology and to continue their classes. The innovative spirit within faculty and staff also led to diverse modes of learning and services, allowing HCC to reach students both in person and online. A day has not gone by without students sharing with me how a professor inspired their future career or, in, or rekindled their love of learning or how a staff member mentored, advised, or coached them to keep going when things looked impossible. I am so proud to be president of an institution that cares so deeply about its students. As you have seen throughout this pandemic, community colleges have been, and they will continue to be, at the forefront of helping our communities rebound. HCC responded to the call for a skilled workforce by serving as a training partner for the Howard County Economic Development Authority's Maryland Innovation Center, and by increasing apprenticeship programs to meet business demand. During 2021, the college graduated nearly 1,300 students who continued their education at four-year universities in preparation for future careers or who went directly into the workforce. Dr. Ball, I ask you to think of HCC faculty and staff when you are building your budget for fiscal year 2023. HCC is asking for a 10% increase in its operating budget, amounting to $3.75 million. This includes a much needed 7% salary increase, funding to cover contracts affected by raising inflation costs and new positions to address teaching and learning. When it comes to employee salaries, HCC has fallen behind its peers. Looking at the past seven years, HCC ranks 11th out of 16 community colleges for employee salary growth. And I'm gonna repeat that again. HCC ranks number 11 out of 16 community colleges for employee salary growth. Every county that borders Howard County had greater salary growth at their community college than Howard Community College. For this fiscal year, HCC also ranked ninth out of the 16 community colleges on employee raises. So please remember, HCC provides only merit increases. There are no step and no cost of living increases. This has meant that since fiscal year 2015, our average merit increase has been just 1.93%. To remain competitive, to attract top talent, to support and to serve our students, we must also support our adjunct faculty through a pay increase, and a higher rate will move HCC closer to our neighboring colleges, such as Prince George's Community College and our partner at the Laurel College Center. On behalf of our outstanding employees at Howard Community College, I sincerely thank you all for your support. Please make a strong investment in your HCC constituents, our employees, our students, and our community. Their work transforms the lives of students and builds a stronger economy for Howard County. Thank you very much for the opportunity this evening. Thank you, Dr. Willis, and welcome aboard again. Next up, we have Christopher Morasco, followed by Jasmira Smothers and Tonia Akins. Christopher's been unmuted. Chris? Yes, I'm here. You're up. All right, thank you. Good evening, County Executive Ball, Mr. Robbins, and Dr. Sun. I am Chris Morosco, Chair of the Howard Community College Board of Trustees. Over the past two years, Howard Community College has been tried and tested, and I'm proud to say, especially as an alum, 
that time and time again, HCC fulfilled its mission of providing pathways to success for our students and community. With a new president at the helm, the college will continue its mission-centric work while also readying, its, readying itself for the new normal in delivering higher education, delivering workforce training, and providing community support. Now, we need your support to make it possible. For fiscal year 2023, we are asking for your investment of $14.79 million for the ongoing construction of a truly innovative facility, the Mathematics and Athletics Complex. This building will provide athletics engagement and essential mathematics education and replaced, replace aged and outdated facilities. This fused facility will serve students and the community and support the, support the demand for graduates in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. With county and matching state funding, it would amount to $29.58 million in pre-authorized funding for this phase of the project. If you haven't had the opportunity to visit the campus recently, you will witness cranes and other heavy equipment moving construction materials to assemble the framework of the building. And it is an exciting transformation to watch. Lastly, as the college nears 52 years of operation, there are critical infrastructure renovations and defer deferred maintenance needed for our aging facilities. Updates and upgrades are needed to reflect advances in technology and design that will help us continue to deliver a high quality education to our students, obtain and retain top talent, and remain competitive with our neighboring higher education alternatives. For fiscal year 2023, the college is requesting $1 million in systemic renovations. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students, I look forward to continuing our work together. As Howard County continues to chart a new future, HCC will continue providing pathways to success. Thank you for your time and for your support as always. And have a great evening. Thank you, and I hope you have a great evening also. Next up, we have Jasmira Smothers, followed by Tonya Akins and Tom Munns. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. We can hear you. All righty. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jasmira Smothers. I'd like to first take a moment to acknowledge and say thank you to County Exec Executive Calvin Ball and uh, the other staff that is present. As I sit here and I reflect on all that I've accomplished over the last few months, I can't help but to think about how great it has been to grow through what it is that I'm going through. On April 12th of 2020, I could have given up. I sat at the bedside of my two-year-old son whose life was coming to an end soon to a tragic accident. As our time together was ending, instead of losing hope for myself, there was a fire set in inside of me that gave me a vision as to how this tragedy was going to be life-changing. In that moment, my vision and plan manifested and became a part of my life sooner than I could imagine. You see, the end goal is to receive my doctorate as a pediatric nurse practitioner someday, but this journey requires a ton of other steps first. Thanks to Howard Community College, I was able to return home after the loss of my son and start working on my dreams right away. I was previously enrolled in some continuing education courses, but it was time to start working on my prerequisites for HCC's nursing program. Fast forward to today, March 14th of 2022, and you can now find my name listed as a certified nursing assistant on the Maryland Board of Nursing. Along with that, you can find me listed as a student waiting on my acceptance into the nursing program. Lastly, and the most astonishing accomplishment, at the 2022 commencement for Howard Community College, you will hear my name called as a first generation graduate receiving my associate degree in general studies. To say that I've done this all on my own would be half of my story. The other half includes a supportive team of individuals from the welcome desk up to the president of Howard Community College. The school has helped me to accomplish this all in less than two years by doing the following providing extensive emotional support, offering education, educational and developmental support, such as their Step Up program, along with me being a member of Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, and lastly, financial support as well. 
I cannot have accomplished my goals of becoming a CNA and a future patient care tech this coming June without HTC scholarships and their guidance. Howard Community College has truly been a blessing when it comes to me defeating my tragedy and transforming it into a testimony. I cannot express how much your continuous support means to all students, and I hope that you'll consider how many lives the college is changing besides my own. Thank you. Thank you to the future Dr. Thank Smothers. Thank you to the Dr. Smothers. <laughs> Up next, we have Tonya Aikens, followed by Tom Munns and Ying Maddies. Tonya's not muted. Tonya? Good evening, Dr. Ball, Mr. Robbins, and Dr. Sun. I am Tonya Aikens, President and CEO of Howard County Library System and a proud resident of Columbia. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Howard County's residents who value the lifelong education provided by our library. Two years ago, we took the unprecedented step of temporarily closing our buildings due to the emerging COVID-19 pandemic. Immediately, our staff pivoted to teach classes online, make more eBooks and other e-content available, and engage the community in new ways. Since then, and as our branches have reopened, we have reimagined how to best serve our community, analyzing what is working well and how we can be more effective. We're engaging people who are eager to gather in person, as well as those who choose to participate virtually due to transportation or childcare issues, work or school schedules, and or other challenges. And with issues of equity always in mind, we continue to examine how best to provide inclusive experiences for everyone in our community. Our strategic priorities include ensuring educational opportunities are innovative, accessible, and convenient for every person in our community. We are doing this by piloting innovative collections that meet our community's needs and exceed their expectations. Increasing access and prevalence of self-directed and collaborative learning experiences. Creating spaces specifically designed to enhance self-directed learning for children birth to five years of age and their caregivers. Partnering with local organizations to enrich learning in our community. And leading strategic community engagement opportunities that enable us to reach new and underserved members of our community who may experience barriers to access. Howard County Library System consistently achieves Library Journal's prestigious five-star ranking for delivering excellence in public education for all ages and was awarded the designation again in 2021. The five-star ranking is attained by fewer than 1% of libraries across the nation, and HCLS is currently the only library system in Maryland to earn this honor. This prestigious ranking is a return on investment measure that speaks to the level of service the library provides the community with, the funding received, and community utilization of our services. However, we are challenged by having enough staffing and resources to meet the demands of our highly educated community. Funding to cover cost increases by publishers and alleviate the deep wait list for physical and eBooks, and funding to keep up with the ever-increasing technology costs. Howard County can no longer boast that it has the highest per capita borrowing in the state. Our board is requesting 24 million for our operating budget, a 7% increase over fiscal year 22. This request will help meet community demand for greater access to books and other collection items, address vendor cost increases and enhance equity and service to all. It includes merit and COLA increases for our highly talented team, who took five furlough days during the pandemic while continuing to serve the community with passion and dedication, two new positions of critical need, a DEI officer and a curriculum service outreach instructor. These positions exist in neighboring systems and across the nation. The pandemic laid bare the number of community members disconnected not only from technology, but also from vital services like the library. Outreach is critical to our path forward to ensuring that we are serving all community members. Funding for increased demand for our collection across all formats. Our goal is to maintain the caliber of our collection, meet customer demands for e-content and other formats, and lessen wait times for materials, especially those related to student learning and school assignments. Our proposal prioritizes direct service to the community and our dedicated team. 
we are mindful of being good stewards of the tax dollars entrusted to us and returning the highest value to our community. I respectfully ask you to fully fund the HCLS Board of Trustees budget request. Thank you so very much. Thank you for your partnership and your testimony. Thank you. Up next, we have Tom Munns, followed by Ying Maddies and Colleen Morris. Tom's been unmuted. Tom? Good evening, County Executive Ball, Dr. Sun, Mr. Robbins, and Mr. Sid. I'm Tom Munns and Chair of the Howard County Library System Board of Trustees and a resident of Ellicott City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the library's capital budget needs this evening. The board is requesting $1.6 million to begin community engagement, planning, and design for the new downtown Columbia branch. It is vital to move this project forward now for several reasons. First, the North-South Connector Jug Handle Project included in the county's 2021 Transportation Priority Letter to the Maryland Department of Transportation is scheduled to be built right through the current central branch. If the money we are requesting is awarded in fiscal year 23, the earliest the new downtown Columbia branch will open is in fiscal year 26. Pushing this out to a future year could potentially leave West Columbia without a library while the new branch is under construction. Secondly, the new 100,000 square foot downtown Columbia branch is critically important as the Meriwether and Lakefront districts are built and the number of people living in those newly developed areas dramatically increases. When Group 4 Architecture updated our 2004 master plan in 2020, they noted that HCLS had not yet achieved the state's requirement of providing one square foot of library space for every Howard County resident. That deficit and our, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, affects our ability to provide service today. We already don't have enough space for classes and in the future as the population grows. Finally, the new branch is envisioned as a vital and vibrant community hub and an anchor for the Meriwether District. The new branch will enable us to expand our curriculum not only to meet current needs, but also emerging trends related to education, business, culture, and the arts for current and future residents. Additionally, it will be the only space in the Meredith Meriwether District fully accessible to the community, regardless of means. As we have stated before, it will be the only public place where families, seniors, and teens can gather, collaborate, and relax without needing to buy something. Or our meeting rooms are uh, one of our the very few spaces available for community groups to use at no cost, and they are often filled not only with our own activities, but also with civic groups, neighborhood associations, and other groups. Libraries are the cornerstone of our communities. On behalf of the thousands of Howard County residents who rely on the library branches every day, I ask that you fully fund our capital budget request for the Howard County Library System and invest in our community's future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Ying Maddies, followed by Colleen Morris and Amy Banadier. Ying has been on mute. Ying? Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the Board of Education's operating budget, including the request to fund a full-time LGBTQIA plus initiative specialist for fiscal year 2023. Last time, I was... Um, in person, <laughs> testifying in the George Howard building was to testify in support of Council Bill 9, 2017, five years ago. It was a bill that signaled to the immigrant community that they belong here in Howard County. As the first generation Chinese American, that message resonated with me deeply. I'm here tonight on behalf of community allies of Rainbow Youth, I would like to speak to the message of belonging to another marginalized community, the LGBTQ community. Around the country, a record number of anti-LGBTQ bills are being proposed and signed into laws with the majority of these bills targeting transgender people. ACLU tracked over 150 anti-LGBTQ bills at state level introduced this year alone ranging from restricting health care or athletic participation for transgender youth to banning inclusive curriculum and materials in schools to preempting local protections. It's not hard to imagine the detrimental impact of these bills on the lives of young people 
especially transgender youth. According to a poll conducted by the Trevor Project late last year, over two thirds of LGBTQ youth surveyed said debates over state laws that target transgender people have negatively impacted their mental health. Last Friday, a nationwide walkout was organized by LGBTQ youth groups to pro protest the proliferation of these bills. Rightfully, they're feeling under attack and they're speaking out for their basic rights and dignity. Most of Howard County high schools and some middle schools participated in the walkout. Student leaders of Gender and Sexuality Alliance and other affinity groups stepped up and organized these walkouts. LGBTQ youth and their allies in these schools are speaking up. We should too. As the county's funding authority, there is no better way to use the budgetary priorities to demonstrate our values and our core beliefs. In a county with stated values of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you have the power to fund the school system's budget request that tries to address the pressing needs of LGBTQ students, staff, and families, as well as many other critical needs in our school system. A full-time specialist will serve as an expert and advocate in support of LGBTQ students, staff, and families in our school system, providing leadership to new and ongoing initiatives, and promoting collaboration among administrators, staff, students, families, and community partners. By funding this position, we can ensure that affirming and inclusive policies and practices are implemented with fidelity. And we continue to continue the progress in fostering a school climate and community culture of belonging for all people. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Colleen Morris, followed by Amy Bandier and Rebecca Audie. Colleen's not muted. Colleen? Good evening, uh, Dr. Ball. I'm Colleen Morris, the proud president of the Howard County Education Association. Our union of educators and staff who serve the students of over 59,000 families in Howard County. Tonight, you will hear from our members directly, the very people who work in our schools day in and day out. I want to start by recognizing and celebrating our educators and staff for everything they have done during the last two years and for what they continue to do to meet the educational, social, and emotional needs of students and families. You too, Dr. Ball, have thanked us through the bonuses you provided this year, and we truly appreciate it. We have also collected written testimony from our members who are likely at home grading and preparing for a full day of work tomorrow, which I'm submitting along with my verbal testimony this evening. As the county executive, it is your responsibility to set an overall budget that meets the needs of our entire county. As with any budget, there are always competing needs, which is why it's so important that we focus on what really matters. Tonight, I want to talk to you about our top three priorities as educators. Compensation, student mental health, and staffing in areas of critical need. For the last two budgets, the county has not had the money to fully fund negotiated compensation increases. There is already fierce competition between counties to hire highly qualified educators in each classroom, and Maryland is an import state for teachers, meaning that we produce fewer educators than, than we need to fill the vacant positions every year. So we are not only competing with other counties, but other states as well for the same pool. At the same time, educators are ex experiencing extreme burnout causing many of them to retire early or leave the profession entirely for a job with better pay and better hours. Another educator leaves nearly every day due to the tremendous stress placed upon them. If we want educators to teach here in Howard County, we have to increase compensation across the board, which is why educators are demanding funding for the 2023 negotiated agreements, included needing comp needed compensation increases for all staff. These agreements will help us attract and retain educators while working towards the goal of a minimum starting salary of 60000 Although our educational support professionals were excluded from the blueprint, we did not exclude them in this agreement, and we know that you agree with us that our support staff are essential in providing educational, social, and emotional support to HCPSS students and families. Second, we want to talk about student mental health. Even before the pandemic, our schools couldn't meet the mental and physical needs of students. 
Now students returning from COVID are facing unprecedented struggles and social emotional needs that we cannot meet without additional resources. That's why our second request of you tonight is to fully fund the positions to support students in these categories. The National Counselor to Student Average is 1 to 250, but Howard County is well above that average at 1 to 500 in many cases. Not only are these caseloads unmanageable, but school counselors perform many other roles in our schools that are not performed by, other, by counselors in other counties. Our last and third request is that you fully fund critical positions in special education. Three years ago, in response to a class action grievance, the Board of Education requested 300 new positions in special education. They received enough funds to hire slightly over 100 new positions, far less than were needed then. This was and continues to be a problem with rippling effects. Staff working in special education are expected to the jobs of two to three people, and their workload simply cannot be sustained. We cannot afford to lose these talented, dedicated, and compassionate individuals. If we don't take action now to shore up staffing in special education, student learning will continue to suffer, and we will find ourselves on the hook for paying for compensatory services and private placements. The school board is requesting over 700 new positions this year, as well as funds to maintain one-to-one -one devices, transportation for later start times, expedited blueprint implementation, and resources for many unmet needs. We know that even with the excess of unanticipated revenues, you will not be able to support the entire request. If you can, and we think it's possible, to fund at least half of the request, it will be the largest investment in public education over the last three decades. We hope that you invest in us as we invest every day in our students. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and thank you especially for the prioritization. Up next, we have Amy Bandier, followed by Rebecca Adi. Amy is not present. Okay, we'll move on to Rebecca. Rebecca is not present. Okay, next up is Veronica Jackson. Veronica is not present. Okay, next up we have Amanda Hoff. Amanda Hoff has been unmuted. Amanda, you're up. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Ball and members of the cabinet. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of Howard County Tourism Council's FY23 funding request. I am Amanda Hoff, Executive Director for Visit Howard County. Our offices and the Howard County Welcome Center are located at 8267 Main Street in Ellicott City's Historic District. First and foremost, on behalf of our board, staff, and the 300 plus tourism businesses and organizations we serve, thank you for your ongoing support. While the annual funding request is critical to our operation, the benefits of working in partnership with you and your team go far beyond the dollars and cents. Your vision, enthusiasm, and innovative thinking when it comes to tourism in Howard County helps motivate our organization to always do more to make Howard County the best place to visit, stay, play, work, and call home. Working in partnership with you and colleague organizations, including Howard County Economic Development Authority and the Howard County Chamber, as well as the Mer Maryland Office of Tourism Development and the numerous others, we have been able to effectively respond to our tourism industry businesses' needs, whether it be helping them connect to recovery resources, advocating for relief and support programs, or keeping them in front of consumers through impactful marketing programs. Just to give a few examples, over the past year, our efforts included providing constant communication with pandemic-related information and resources, such as local and state guidelines and exec executive orders, relief programs, stay COVID safe messaging for them to share, and vaccine and clinic testing access, uh, vac vaccine clinic and testing access information for their employees. Working in partnership with Howard County Econ Economic Development Authority, to administer $2.2 million in HOCO Rise business support grants to our hotels, launching an impactful new and improved Visit Howard County look, website, and visitor's guide, expanding hours, programming, and exhibits at the Howard County Welcome Center. Events and programming over the past 12 months have included two art exhibits that kick off to Shop Small Saturday, Main Street, Ellicott City's holiday tree lighting, and the kickoff to EC250 and the current Milltown, Milltown to City exhibit. Bringing the 2021 Major League Quidditch Championships to Howard County and the region for the first time ever. 
continuing our support for and welcoming back the annual National High School Lacrosse Showcase where over 3,500 athletes and 500 coaches from nearly every state convened in Howard County. Work and workforce shortage is among the latest challenges in our tourism industry businesses and organizations. Uh, one of the uh, latest challenges our businesses and organizations are faced with. With your support and the recent award of the Howard County and BGE Energizing Small Business grant awarded to our organization, we will soon address the workforce shortage through a highly visible media campaign that will raise awareness and appreciation and recognize the thousands of individuals working in our hotels, restaurants, retail stores, and attractions. This campaign will publicly recognize and thank our frontline hospitality workers and rally the community to show their support. On the marketing front, our organization ran over a dozen major campaigns across social media, digital platforms, radio, television, and print advertising. Campaigns included Howard County Hidden Gems, unique television campaigns for Ellicott City and Savage Mill, Howard County Restaurant Weeks, Summertime Arts and Culture, Farm and Flavor, and Home for the Holidays. Over the past year and a half, we were able to increase marketing impressions by nearly 50% and measured 19 million impressions in FY21 alone. Over FY21 and 22, we received incremental marketing grants from the Maryland Office of Tourism Development in response to the impacts of the uh, pandemic, and then additional support from your administration that allowed us to significantly increase our marketing spend and elevate awareness of all there is to see and do in Howard County. One of our highly visible programs includes, mar includes uh, marketing impressions for Howard County attractions throughout the mall in Columbia. Increased media placement and strong marketing programs remain critical to the economic recovery of Howard County's tourism industry. While our tourism businesses and organizations are incredibly appreciative and humbled for the relief programs that helped keep their doors open, consumer spending is ultimately the key to their economic sustainability. While we recognize we are one of the many worthy causes in need of your support, we thank you for considering to fully fund Howard County Tourism Council's FY23 funding request. With your support, our organization is uniquely situated to help heal our community by getting consumers back to our businesses and get businesses cash registers ringing again and again. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Amanda, for your testimony and for all of your collaboration helping us get through this. Up Thank next, you. we have Jonathan Edelson, followed by Joan Dreesen and Angela Bloves. Jonathan has been unmuted. Jonathan? Jonathan, you're up. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sun, uh, Mr. Howland, uh, Dr. Ball, County Executive Ball. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, testify tonight. I am Jonathan Edelson. I am chairman of the Oakland Mills Community Association and delivering this testimony on behalf of the Oakland Mills Board of Directors. Uh, we have a few categories. I'd like to start with uh, schools and education. Um, and uh, this is uh, maybe a relatively easy one because we're not asking for anything in fiscal 23. However, we are asking that you uh, commit to plan ahead with the state and with the school system for the timely funding of the long overdue deferred renovations of Oakland Mills Middle and Oakland Mills High in fiscal years 24, 24 and 2026 respectively. Uh, these schools over have $100 million in deferred maintenance um, including replacing an, a heating, ventilation, ventilation, and air conditioning system at the high school that the school system itself concluded could no longer support an environment conducive to learning. Uh, moving on, uh, several years ago, our community was approached by the Department of Public Works to discuss two streetscape projects. After community collaboration and several meetings, the county went ahead with a streetscape project on a small portion of Whiteacre Road. We appreciate this aesthetically enhanced road, but we're concerned that the project did not address the many safety issues on Stevens Forest Road. The severity of this is sadly highlighted by a preventable traffic crash at the intersection of Stevens Forest Road and Kilimanjaro Road, where a kid, a car hit a middle school student in the crosswalk as the student rode their bike to school several months ago. 
Members of our board and our public space committee have spent, sent numerous letters, including videos documenting the unsafe conditions along the entire stretch of Stevens Forest Road. This is the main road into Oakland Mills and the only main roadway in the 10 villages of Columbia that has residential driveways directly on the road. More importantly, Stevens Forest Road has four nearby schools that students walk to and from. We honestly feel that our documented concerns have not been heard. Our numerous letters to the county detailed each intersection and pedestrian crossing along Stevens Forest Road and included suggestions to address the safety issues with short term immediate fixes to long term projects. We would like the county to study the intersection of White Acre Road and Stevens Forest Road and present to the community the safest option for that intersection. We also feel traffic signal upgrades, including a lead pedestrian interval at Kilimanjaro Road and Stevens Forest Road would make that intersection safer. Moving on, we support Columbia Association's request that the county immediately remove several miles of dead trees or dying trees in the center medians of and along Broken Land Parkway and Governor Warfield Parkways. Additionally, uh, the medians in Oakland Mills are maintained through a contract with the, between the county and the Columbia Association during the spring and summer months. There is no maintenance to the medians at any other time. Funding for leaf removal maintenance to alleviate the leaf problem is warranted and requested. Therefore, we continue to advocate for the county to invest in leaf vacuum machines. Currently, the leaves that have fallen on median strips will remain until the spring when the median is mowed. The leaves now blow into the streets, blocking the roadway and finding their way into the storm drains, severely clogging the drains. Moving on, Bland Air Park, as evidenced by the number of large events held throughout the year and its great playgrounds and ball, uh, ball fields, is very popular. This is a gem in our neighborhood. How of, however, our community often feels the burden of the popularity of the park and does not receive all the benefits it could uh, from having this amenity in our community. Each year, we ask that the county work with us to install signage directing park users to the merchants at the Oakland Mills Village Center, located within walking distance to the event parking and the park itself. We are asking for more than small wayfinding signs on posts. We're asking the county to help support the Oakland Mills Village mer merchants in the same spirit that our community supports the large scale events that draw thousands to Bland Air Park. The county's support of older villages is vital to the existence of the aging village centers. Investing economic development funds by providing directional signs promoting the Oakland Mills merchants provides a simple and unique opportunity for the county to work with Oakland Mills merchants and promote our village shops and restaurants. A strong community and county partnership will hopefully lead to thriving business for our new and longstanding merchants. Finally, uh, the Oakland Mills Village Board of Directors supports extending a path from the Orchard Green Tot Lot to the Red Branch Road Light on Maryland Route 108, providing safe and legal pedestrian and bicycle access to the Red, Red Branch Road businesses across the street from Oakland Mills Village. However, we need a small budget and commitments from the state, Howard County, and the Columbia Association to make this connection. What we need from the county is a, a connection path um, that would connect the uh, Orchard Green Path um, to the pedestrian crosswalk that would be provided by the state across its road. Howard County would have to provide the shared use, the short shared use pathway, while Columbia Association would provide the path extension to that pathway. We are requesting the county's help to facilitate a budget for the shared use pathway and to gain commitments for this much needed complete street solution among CA, the county, and the state. Thank you very much. You as always for your testimony. Up next, we have Joan Dreesen, followed by Angela Blows. One moment, please. Joan's been unmuted. Joan? Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Ball, Dr. Sun, Mr. Robbins, and Mr. Sid. I'm offering testimony on testimony on behalf of the Association of Community Services and our over 150 member organizations and community advocates to advocate for a budget that more fully supports Howard County nonprofits. ACS has been representing our nonprofit sector for almost 60 years. During this time, our members have ensured that residents in need are fed, housed, clothed, and supported when faced with health challenges. They have reliably demonstrated their ability to work collaboratively with county government, for-profit businesses and fellow nonprofits to meet the needs of our residents quickly, effectively, and creatively. This has been particularly evident in the past two years as they played a critical role in addressing the impact of the pandemic. However, despite all their best efforts to leverage donations, grants, and volunteers to supplement their budgets, 
many of our nonprofits are struggling financially. The hard truth of the matter is that nonprofits have been struggling financially for a long time, and we have arrived at a point of facing very difficult decisions. Even as they continue to do tremendous work with limited resources, there are ever growing unmet needs. We can no longer get by with so little. For some organizations, the short term influx of support experienced during the pandemic has run out or is about to run out and they face tough decisions ahead about whether they can continue to serve residents. Now is the time to rethink the way we fund services so that they are truly sustainable for our future or we stand to lose critical programs and partners in the Howard County community. As I'm sure you are aware, the Spending Affordability Advisory Committee noted in their recent FY23 report that nonprofits deserve increased investment and support from the county to help provide needed service to residents and mitigate increased challenges posed by not only by the pandemic, but also minimum wage impact and recruitment difficulties. Such a valuable partnership and a robust nonprofit community, not enjoyed by many other jurisdictions, saved the county from providing services directly at a potentially much higher cost. Like other businesses, nonprofits are coping with the effects of record infl inflation and are experiencing very high staff turnover. Unlike for profit businesses, nonprofits must absorb these increased costs and try to fundraise or seek grants to cope. Because reimbursement, excuse me, reimbursement rates are often determined by government. There are limitations on passing on costs to the people we serve, and there are very few grants that will fund general operational expenses. Moreover, because wages are low and benefits are often limited or non-existent, we struggle to recruit new employees and to even maintain current employees. Our community deserves fully staffed and well-resourced service providers, and our nonprofit workforce deserves wages and benefits that value the critical work that we do. As I did in December, I once again ask that you first dedicate funds for operational and program support for nonprofits without onerous application and reporting requirements. Second, increase funding for the community service partnership grants and one time grants, particularly since they have been level funded for many years. And third, use our current sub surplus to address nonprofit infrastructure and operational needs. We also urge you to invest in a housing opportunities trust fund that can make a meaningful contribution to affordable housing in Howard County. Affordable housing directly impacts our ability to keep a steady workforce. Above all, it is an issue of equity that disproportionately impacts black and brown residents, seniors, and people with disabilities. Too many people in our community struggle to stretch their fixed or low or even moderate inc incomes to stay in their homes and still pay for basic necessities. A robust housing trust fund can be a significant force in moving the housing equity needle forward efficiently and effectively, but to do so will require a major investment. We strongly urge you to use FY22 pandemic related surplus revenues to invest new monies to seed and jumpstart this trust fund. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of our nonprofit community. We value our strong our partnership with county government and the opportunity to work together to ensure that community members have equitable access to the resources they need to thrive. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and all your work in our community. Thanks. Up next, we have Angela Blows, and we're gonna go back to Rebecca Audie. Angela is not present. I uh, will go back to Rebecca Audie. Rebecca has been unmuted. Rebecca? Hi, thank you. Uh, and thank you for coming back to me. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening, Dr. Ball and members of the administration. My name is Rebecca Audi. I'm a resident of Laurel, and I've been a classroom teacher with HCPSS for 21 years. I first want to thank you for your support of educators in the county. The recent one-time bonus of, one, of $1,800 was a meaningful boost to overburdened staff in a school year where many educators are wondering how much longer they'll be able to cope with the stresses. And the passage of CB82 means that our food service workers who remained in person every day during the pandemic will all make at least $15 an hour for the first time next school year. These were tangible ways of showing support and, pre and appreciation, and they're an important part of recruiting and retaining employees for our county's public school system. Thank you for working with HCPSS and the County Council to make them happen. 
I'm here tonight with specific budget requests that will be the next steps in the recruitment and retention process. The first is to fully fund HCEA's negotiated agreements, which provide needed cost of living adjustments, the aforementioned increase in food service worker wages, and they put us on the path to go beyond the blueprint mandated $60,000 starting salary for educators. I personally know three people who've left HCPSS in the last few years to go work for Montgomery, and we will start losing educators to many other counties if our salaries and benefits don't remain competitive. My second ask is to fund the new special ed positions in the HCPSS budget request. A major source of the stress driving educators out of the classroom is the workload, and its impact is likely felt most deeply by our special ed staff and related service providers. We were still trying to come back from staffing being scuttled when the pandemic hit. Now we have to make up ground with students whose needs may not have been fully met during virtual instruction, and we're tasked with doing it with staffing levels that weren't sufficient to begin with. A colleague of mine was taken to the hospital this year with what she thought was a heart attack, and it turns out it was a panic attack during, due to the stress of her job. The school system absolutely must have these new special ed positions to meet the needs of not only our students, but also our special educators. Finally, I'm asking that you fund the proposed new counselor and school psychologist positions. Everyone in the county experienced trauma these last few years, and it's crucial that our students have access to the mental health resources to deal with it. We are seeing so many more behaviors this school year as a direct result of the pandemic and building closures. And again, we were already short staffed to begin with. National standards suggest that school counselors have only 250 students. In 2019, the counselor at my school had 631 students. Our students cannot be available for learning if their health and well being needs aren't being met. They need these new positions funded. I know that there are many worthwhile programs and services that all ask for a piece of the budget. As a resident and a classroom teacher, I ask that you be sure to include HCEA's negotiated agreements and the funding pro for proposed new special ed, counselor, and school psych positions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And again, thank you for the prioritization. It's helpful. Up next, we have Dan Neuberger followed by Aaron Parker. One moment, please. Dan's been unmuted. Dan? Dan, you're up. Okay, we're going to move on to Aaron Parker. Aaron, my name is Aaron Parker. Dr. Ball, we ask that you prioritize increased positions for certificated special educators and reading specialists in this year's budget. Year after year, the special education budget has been underfunded. It has had a profound impact on our students with disabilities, our teachers, and other students. Because the special education budget has been historically underfunded, it has created some unacceptable and expensive outcomes. Due to staffing shortage, shortages, the school system is incentivized to find students ineligible for special education services, despite clear evidence that students qualify for an IEP. Special education teachers have suffered injuries due to lack of proper staffing and an inability to meet students' needs. Special educator workloads far exceed their individual capacities, which means that children do not get the service hours that they need to catch up, especially in reading. Teachers who are certified as special educators have chosen not to serve students with disabilities, undoubtedly due to the unsustainable workloads of special educators. Each year, we watch as the special education budget increases budgeted by Dr. Monterano are cut because special education is a big ticket item. It has a big price tag because it has been underfunded for so long that it is difficult to meet the need without a major adjustment. Continuing to underfund special education leads to worse outcomes for teachers and students. Approximately 30% of elementary school students were below or well below benchmark when screened for reading foundational skills. 40 to 45% of students across all grades are not proficient in English language arts according to MCAP scores. 60 to 65% of Black and Hispanic students are not proficient on the MCAP. 
The pandemic has exacerbated the issue of underfunding special education as more and more students need special education in order to catch up after the adverse impact virtual learning had on our children. If we could properly fund special education and reduce the workloads on our special educators, students would benefit by getting the services they deserve and our teachers who are certified in special education may come back to serving children with disabilities. For several years, we have advocated for training and structured literacy so that interventions that are used are evidence-based and effective, especially for students with dyslexia. But without adequate personnel to support the students who have been provided an IEP, it is difficult to make progress on much needed professional development in the best methods for teaching reading. Fully funding the superintendent's request for additional special education positions is a moral imperative. Dr. Wall, please prioritize increasing positions for certificated special educators and reading specialists so that we can get to a baseline of staff needed to support students with special needs. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. And again, thank you for the prioritization. That's helpful. Uh, we're going to go back to Dan Newberger. Dan's been unmuted. Dan? Hi. Hi, can you hear me this time? We can. All right, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Good evening, Dr. Ball, Mr. Robbins, Mr. Sid, Dr. Sun. My name is Dan Newberger, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. I want to briefly speak about the FY23 requested operating budget submitted by the Board of Education. Like most Howard County residents, my family is deeply invested in our wonderful school district. My two children are both HCPSS students. My oldest is a sixth grader at Harper's Choice Middle School and my youngest is a third grader at Swansfield Elementary. I'm currently serving as an officer on the Swansfield PTA, and my wife is an officer on the Harper's Choice PTA. I'm also a member of the HCPSS Community Advisory Committee, and I'm in my second year serving on the Operating Board Review Committee. I'm also a candidate for an at-large seat on the Board of Ed. Um, first, Dr. Ball, I wanna thank you for your support of our schools, not just this year, but every year you've served as county executive and throughout your tenure on the county council. You've been a steadfast supporter of our children, our educators, and our schools. And a special thank you for spearheading the bonuses for our educators by dedicating that $8 million in American Rescue Plan funds. It was an important gesture of appreciation to the teachers and staff who worked so hard uh, throughout the pandemic under such difficult circumstances. I know that every budgeting cycle is full of difficult decisions, and this year may be one of the most difficult in recent memory. But I'm here tonight to ask you to prioritize the operating budget requested by the Board of Ed as much as you can. This year's requested HCPSS operating budget represents a significant increase over last year's budget, almost 40 million, 38.6 million increase, which is about 14%. It's clearly a, a big increase. However, when you dig into the details of the budget, it, it's clear that there's not much that can be considered superfluous. The rollout of the blueprint for Maryland's future is obviously a major driver um, in the funding increases, totaling over 34 million and around 200 positions that we have to have in place starting in FY23. The blueprint will have a significant positive impact on our schools and our children, but only if the county fully funds its portion um, and not at the expense of other HCPSS needs. The requested budget is full of many other significant initiatives to improve classroom education, including compensation for staff to, agree, to, to meet agreed bargaining agreements, reducing class size by one student at every grade level, increased support for critical shortages in special ed staffing, funding for the recent initiative to adjust school times, school start times, um, and other critical investments to meet increased student needs. Other key items include the funding for uh, health and well-being services, enhanced support for technology needs, um, and ongoing support for Dr. Morano's strategic call to action, learning and leading with equity. In conclusion, please do everything you can to fund as much of the Board of Ed's requested operating capital budgets as you can. As we head into the home stretch of this third consecutive school year impacted by the pandemic, the county must do everything it can to fully fund the needs of our hardworking educators who work so hard to educate our county's children. There's so many difficult budgeting decisions to be made, but I'm confident you'll continue to prioritize and invest in our children, our educators, and our schools. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you so much for your testimony. And again, I appreciate the prioritization. Up next, we have Jen Lyon, followed by Greg Kaufman. Jen is not present. Okay, next up we have Greg. Greg is not present. Okay, next up we have Richard Hess. 
There's no Richard Hess, but there is an RH, which we will unmute in one second. RH is been unmuted. Richard? Richard, you're up. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, next up, we have Nick Novak. One moment, please. Nick has been unmuted. Nick? Hello, how are you? I'm good. You're up. All right, excellent. Good evening. My name is Nick Novak, and I'm the president of the Howard County Association of Supervisors and Administrators, or HCASA. I am principal of Howard High School, a resident of Howard County, and a parent of a sixth grader at Mayfield Woods Middle School. I'm here this evening to speak in support of the Howard County Board of Education budget request. To begin my remarks, I will start with your words, Dr. Ball, not mine. For many Howard County parents, students, and teachers, these past 18 months have been especially grueling, and now it is more important than ever to keep investing in our educational systems. Your op-ed from September 2021 couldn't be truer, especially six months later as we mark two years since our school system closed due to the pandemic. We shifted to virtual instruction, we shifted to hybrid instruction, but now we have returned to in-person instruction. But the reality is that we are not picking up where we left off. Our students, staff, and families are showing the impact that the pandemic has had on education, and the way we used to do things won't cut it anymore. And that includes how we fund education. It is more important than ever to keep investing in our educational systems. As building and school system leaders, our administrators and supervisors see firsthand the crises our students and families are facing. Staff do their best to try to address students' academic and social emotional needs, but we just don't have the resources to effectively support students as the demands of our positions increase. The Board of Education's budget request includes specific allocations to address these needs. As HCPSS acknowledged, there are many competing priorities and the county will not be able to fund every new initiative. For the Howard County Association of Supervisors and Administrators, here are six of the priorities we see in the budget. Increased special education funding. Our schools face critical staffing shortages in special education. Teachers who already have too much on their plates are having to do even more and the effects have been devastating. The additional positions will go a long way in supporting our special education students and the staff who teach them. All right, just moving along here. Number two, additional nurses, PPWs, counselors, and other mental health professionals. The funding for additional positions will ensure that teachers can focus on teaching and that students have access to the social emotional supports they need at school. As we've seen countless times over the last year, this is a much needed area for us to support our students at schools. Number three, transpor transportation enhancements. Like many offices, transportation is understaffed and struggling to keep up with the work demands. As HCPSS adds more schools and prepares to change school start times, the funding for transportation is required to ensure that these changes are implemented successfully. Four, technology support. The pandemic forced HCPSS into a situation where a one-to-one -one device deployment was necessary for the continuity of instruction. As we have returned to in-person learning, these devices and the supporting infrastructure have provided access to many students and families who have gone without in the past. The funding for technology will help us sustain this level of access. Five, class size reduction. Class size does matter when it comes to a teacher's ability to make connections with students as well as a teacher's workload. If a teacher spends 10 minutes to grade a paper, for example, and teaches five classes over the course of the day, one fewer student in each class would be a reduction of almost one hour of grading time. Our students deserve more attention and our staff deserve more time. And finally, number six, staff compensation. The blueprint is driving a fundamental shift in how we compensate educators, but it's important to recognize that this is not just required, but the right thing to do. Increasing salaries while also in addressing workload is imp are important steps in addressing the recruiting and retention crisis we are facing in education. We appreciate the opportunity to share our testimony this evening, and thank you for your careful consideration of the Board of Education's budget request. 
Difficult decisions will have to be made, but significant funding will meet many of the immediate needs of our school system and begin to incrementally address other priorities for our staff and students. Thank you. Principal Novak, for all that you do and uh, for your testimony. And again, the prioritization is helpful. Next up, we have Jennifer Broderick, followed by Barb Fuller. Jennifer's been muted. Jennifer? Hi, good evening, everyone. Sorry, let me. Uh, I'm so glad to be here tonight, and thank you for the support of um, County Executive for all that you've done for us at Bridges to Housing Stability. On behalf of Bridges, I am, um, I'm here to support the proposed operating budget for the Community Service Partnership funding for the, um, through the Department of Community Resources and Services and the budget for the Howard County Department of Housing and Community Development, including funding for the Housing Trust Fund. We appreciate the county executive's consideration to keep funding level funding level for CSP grants and plan to end homelessness dollars. This is the third year of level CSP and plan to end homeless dollars for nonprofits in the county. For 32 years, Bridges has provided rehousing and stability services for low income households and those experiencing homelessness in the county. Thousands of individuals have been impacted and stably housed long term. We have struggled this past year, couple of years, to hold fundraising events that raise as much funding as the in person events we held prior to the pandemic. Knowing that the CSP and planned and homeless dollars will be level helps us to continue to serve the most vulnerable, employ 20 staff, and help those whose housing is in jeopardy because of job loss or sickness caused by the pandemic. I ask that you remember that having stable housing is one of the top indicators of success also for students in school. Bridges work is important for the hundreds of students that are, are experiencing homelessness and need stable housing to be engaged in school. Operation funds and program funds that pay salaries are essential to our success. We will continue to work with the Department of Community Resources and Services and the Coalition to End Homelessness to move forward in keeping homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring in Howard County. It will be a challenge to maintain staff and provide cost of living increases to retain these positions with level funding, but we hope that we can count on the county executive to encourage Howard County residents to support our fundraising efforts to make up the difference between our rising costs and the level funding we hope to receive from the Department of Community Resources and Services. For the past two years, our staff has not stopped providing services to our clients for even a day due to the pandemic. Our committed program staff meet clients evenings, weekends, and whenever they need to support them. Even though many aspects of the worst of the pandemic are over, there are lingering difficulties for our clients. Our program staff are seeing rents in the county that are hundreds of dollars more per month than the same apartment was two years ago. People with fixed incomes or minimum wage jobs don't have hundreds more to spend on rent with the cost of food, gas, childcare, and other essentials also up significantly. Landlords are incentivized to not renew leases and to find lease violations to get renters out because they can increase the rent significantly for a new rental while there are rental increase limits for households already in housing. Our neighbors are struggling and evictions are growing despite our work to help many with assistance dollars. The Howard County Department of Housing and Community Development support allows Bridges to continue to provide additional scattered site affordable housing solutions to low income households. There is at least a 6,000 unit gap for this income group. The housing trust fund dollars will be essential for improving this gap in housing for those that need it most. 90 households have been helped through our housing connections and Bridges Alliance programs through these funding sources. And none of these households were able to find affordable housing in the county before they came to Bridges and entered one of these programs, supported in large part by the Howard County Department of Housing and Community Development through the years. Bridges continues to leverage the funding through the CSP, Plan to End Homelessness, and Department of Housing and Community Development dollars with hundreds of thousands of other funding to continue the work to serve more people in need. I hope you'll continue to support these items in the budget. Many other organizations also depend on them. Thank you for your service to the county and your support. 
Thank you for your testimony and your partnership. Up next, we have Barb Fuller followed by Kelly Kleinfelter. Barbara is not present. Okay, up next, we have Kelly Kleinfelter. One moment, please. Kelly's been unmuted. Kelly? Good evening, Dr. Ball. My name is Kelly Kleinfelter. I live in Columbia, and I'm the president of the Howard Progressive Project and the co-chair of the Living Wage Howard County Coalition. I'm also a Baltimore City Schools teacher, a member of the Baltimore Teachers Union, and a proud Swansfield Harper's Choice and Wild Lake parent. I'm here this evening to urge you to fully fund the HCEA negotiated agreements, which provide over $40 million in compensation increases for our educators and staff. Howard Progressive Project's central organizing principle is community. We envision a more just and equitable Howard County, a place where every person can grow to their fullest potential. This includes most urgently our children. It need not be said that our community's children are our most precious resource. They're the best of us, all that's new and possible, and each of us wants what is best for our children. Ask around and you'll hear that people move here often at great cost for the chance for their children to attend our excellent public schools. As parents, we want this system because of its lasting commitment to music and arts, to physical fitness and athletics, to outdoor education, to enrichment, to inclusion, to STEM education, to career academies. We want and we demand, as we rightly should for our children, excellent educational programming. But for too long, we've underinvested in the people who work in our schools. We've built a system in which our, we expect our educators and support personnel to work for salaries that don't provide for their basic needs, that don't provide for their families, that don't allow them to live in our community, and that don't make our district competitive with other districts in Maryland. The most important people in a school building are the students. Schools exist to serve them and their social, emotional, and academic learning needs. Every adult in the building, every single one, must come to work every day ready to meet each child where they are with empathy and understanding. This has always been demanding work, and it's especially difficult now as our children face unprecedented learning, behavior, and mental health challenges after two years of pandemic-related school interruptions and alterations. Surely the food service workers who prepare and serve our students their breakfast and lunch each day deserve a wage that honors their hard work. We're grateful to the county executive and to uh, the county council for passing and signing CB 82 2021. Because of that bill, our food service workers negotiated a $15 starting wage beginning in the 2022-23 school year. And it's great to see the ripples of that movement in our community. The folks who spend the most time with our children, of course, are their teachers. And I say this as a teacher myself, our educator core is in crisis. Teachers are retiring and changing professions in numbers not seen before the pandemic and education programs are seeing severe declines in enrollment. An Education Week survey from October reported that 48% of administrators struggled to staff classrooms last fall. There are vacancies in our schools now mid-year leaving students not getting what they need, and that's in Howard County. Under these circumstances, competition to hire qualified teachers is going to continue to be fierce. Our goal in Howard County should continue to be to provide the very best educational system for our children, and that must start with staffing our schools with the very best people, and that requires investment. Let's commit to recruiting the very best educators in the state by meeting the challenge of the blueprint for Maryland's future and fund the HCPSS budget so that our teachers have a starting salary beyond the $60,000 minimum. And let's commit to retaining the very best educators in the state by raising the salaries of all of our teachers. Our experienced teachers are the foundations of our school buildings and serve as invaluable mentors to our new teachers. Let's fully fund the HCEA negotiated agreements. HPP and the Living Wage Howard County Coalition are proud to stand tonight in solidarity with our HCEA brothers and sisters and with every one of our Howard County kids in saying this. Invest in our educators and school staff so they can invest in our kids. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for your testimony. And again, it helps to know the prioritization in this budget. Next up, we have Vincent Zagorski, followed by Gerald Krasnick. Vincent's been unmuted. Vincent? Yes. You're up. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Ball and committee members. 
As a proud resident of Howard County for over 30 years, I'm making my first ever remarks to the county executive and the budget committee to call attention to two areas that I feel need further attention. The two areas are completion of sidewalks and taking action to rectify a vacant business property that has become an embarrassing eyesore. Let's start with sidewalks. I live in the Kingswoods community in North Laurel, and I walk the neighborhood streets daily for exercise. And I frequently bring along a trash bag and a grabber stick to remove roadside litter. My thinking is that it doesn't take much effort to pick it up rather than stepping over it. So why not help keep the area around my neighborhood a bit neater while I'm exercising? The sidewalks that I use along Whiskey Bottom Road heading toward US Route 1 often end abruptly, forcing pedestrians to step into the street for one or several blocks until the next portion of sidewalk appears. I'm aware of the Walk Howard initiative by the county, and indeed plans to extend the sidewalks along Whiskey Bottom Road exist, but await funding. If anyone on the council is unclear how risky it is to walk in these areas, I invite you to join me on a walk to see how my fellow pedestrians and I are standing mere inches from cars that are often exceeding the posted 30 mile per hour speed limit. They're zipping by mostly oblivious to our presence. Even more alarming is when I see families with kids in tow walking these sections, sometimes with a stroller or a tricycle. It's simply unsafe. The second area needing action is a vacant business property at the intersection of Whiskey Bottom Road and US Route 1, formerly known as the California Inn. For anyone unfamiliar, this was a nightclub slash karaoke bar that closed down and has been abandoned for many years. The Department of Inspections and Licensing was able to persuade the property owner to erect a chain link fence around the perimeter to at least keep the parking lot from being used as a dumping ground. Unfortunately, the fence has now been sliced open by intruders. The derelict building is in terrible shape and is covered with graffiti. It's an embarrassment to the fine people who live along Whiskey Bottom Road and the adjacent neighborhoods that this eyesore has become the gateway into our community from Route 1. I'm aware that Howard County already owns two other vacant land parcels adjacent to the former California Inn property. My request is for the county to either purchase the California Inn land with the intention of selling the entire combined parcel as a business venue to some new owners, or perhaps look into some steps to encourage the existing owner to take action to clean up the site. I thank you for your time and your consideration of these items. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next up, we have Gerald Krasnick, followed by Crystal Shelley. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm here representing approximately 200 families that live on Banneker Place and Wyndham Place on Banneker Road. Nearly every single family, if not all, are vehemently against the Firehouse Residential Project at, at the Banneker Firehouse. Our two neighborhoods are close to 30 years old. When we moved here, um, it was literally impossible to build anything else, much less a residential building. Not only was there no more space, but there was no land that could be legally zoned as residential. So to circumvent that legal problem um, and bend the rules, Howard Hughes Corporation, CA, Howard County Housing Commission, and the county drummed up a backdoor middle of the night plan without letting any of us on Banneker Road know until we happened to see a general posting somewhere. Uh, when Banneker Road was constructed, it was just to house the Exxon station and the firehouse. That's it. They ended up allowing two neighborhoods to be built, thus filling up the rest of the allowable space on Banneker Road, since beyond our two communities is a small buffer of trees and wetlands. Note that Banneker is not a through street, nor is it connected to any other outlet. Back when Lloyd Thacker owned the Exxon station back in the 70s and 80s, it was simply just selling gas and had a few bays for a mechanic's garage, probably a couple hundred cars a day, probably more when Meriwether had a concert, nothing else. Since that time, the population has exploded in that area, in our area, and the new owner now sells gas at much higher volume, has a convenience store, eight mechanics bays, a car wash, 
six vacuum stations, and a fast food restaurant, Waterloo Pizza and Subs, and a very active outdoor ATM. It is absolute mayhem over there. We have witnessed multiple fender benders just in the Exxon parking lot alone, not to mention on Banneker Road, the traffic is out of control. There's also an office building on that on that that has multiple businesses. There was a fire a few years back on at Wyndham. Nobody could exit our neighborhood for hours because there was no other way out. We have so many cars that leave the Exxon with its six separate businesses thinking Banneker Road is a through street, and they come down the street into our neighborhood speeding and not obeying the right of way, making it dangerous situations. This isn't about the greater good. We feel like if you cared about the greater good, you would give a crap about us and the craziness that's happening with our traffic issues and see that it makes absolutely no sense to add more people and more cars onto Banneker Road, which is 100 yards, that's it. We feel this is all about the mighty dollar, and we feel like we're just collateral damage to you. Please, please, please stop the madness. And stop comparing it to Potomac Yards, which people um, supporting this project have done. So Potomac Yards is a facility um, on an entire city block and has four through streets surrounding it. We're a hundred yard road dead end with no through streets. There is no comparison whatsoever. Um, you know, we, we're, we're at the point where we're ready to like start looking into filing injunctions. We sign, we have a petition out right now on change.org. We already in less than a week have over almost 500 signatures. Almost every single person in our neighborhood is against this. Uh, we did back when we found out about this back in, I don't know, it was 2016, somewhere around there. Um, we hired someone to do a traffic study. Guess what? It failed. It failed without the, without the residential on top of the firehouse because of all the blind spots. It's an unsafe road. And now you guys want to build 100 units on top of the firehouse and use, I think, the... Um, a ratio you gave with 1.3 cars per unit. That's 230 cars. That's not including the people who are going to be delivering things there. UPS, FedEx, Amazon. Uh, that doesn't include people that have they have guests coming over. Um, you're talking a lot more cars. So before you approve this for the budget, um, I think that there has to be a big, big, big conversation about this and traffic studies have to be done um it's dangerous so please um uh you know meet with us before this gets approved and uh, we can show you why it's not a good fit here we feel like you're putting a square peg through a round hole um if you've ever been to banneker road it literally is about a hundred yards and it's dead end there, that's it. It dead ends into our neighborhood, and that's all. We have tons of cars that continually come out of the Exxon station and think that they're going down a through street and come into our neighborhood. And I mean, people don't even want to let their kids um, play play around in our neighborhood because of that. So anyhow, thank you very much. Happy Pi Day. Take care. Thank you very much for your testimony, and Happy Pi Day back to you. Next up, we have Nina Basu. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Yes, you're up. Thank you very much. I apologize. Nina Basu for the Inner Arbor Trust. Thank you for taking your testimony this evening. The Inner Arbor Trust respectfully requests funding from the county for three projects slated to occur in Symphony Woods, the colonnade, a comprehensive lighting plan, and a play structure. The Inner Arbor Trust is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that holds a phased easement on the 51 acres of open space in downtown Columbia known as Symphony Woods. The mission of the trust is to promote and nurture a park in a unique natural setting for a variety of arts and culture experiences that enrich the entire community. The trust activities are in two general areas, arts and cultural programming, the vast majority of which is presented at no charge to the entire community and the preservation protection and enhancement of symphony woods in to an environmentally sound sustainable community arts park for all dr ball thank you for your consistent support of the trust both on the county council and throughout your first term as county executive 
Thanks to you, the trust has been able to enhance Symphony Woods, build the chrysalis, and thanks to your leadership, install almost $200,000 worth of conservation landscaping and environmental enhancements, as well as provide dozens of free events every spring, summer, and fall that embrace our diverse community. In 2020 and into 2021, the trust, along with a community-led uh, team of institutional stakeholders and residents, undertook a focused review of the planning of Symphony Woods and adopted a new community-driven concept plan. This community, this community vision is what we are hoping the county will continue to fund in FY 2023. We appreciate the many priorities on the county budget and understand that they are all important. I ask tonight that the county also consider investing a different kind of infrastructure, arts for all, culture for all, and environmental sustainability for all. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much for your partnership and your testimony. Next up, we have Crystal Shelley, followed by Kelly McKim. Crystal's not present. Okay. Next up, we'll go to Kelly McKim. Kelly? Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Can you hear me? Hear me? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Hello and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Kelly McKim and I am a teacher with 17 years of service in Howard County in the Howard County Public School System. I'm a product of Howard County Schools and currently teach at the same elementary school I attended as a child. I'm here tonight to urge you to fully fund the HCEA negotiated agreements, increase funds for special education, and ensure funding for additional school counselors, psychologists, and support personnel. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted everyone in ways we have yet to know or understand. For students, families, and educators, the past two years have been extremely difficult. This has led to an exponential increase in the number of students needing support dealing with their social and emotional needs. National standards dictate that a school counselor should not be responsible for more than 250 students at any given time. However, in many of our schools, counselors are responsible for 500 to 600 students. Students in crisis are having to wait to access school counselors or support staff. This is not fair to our students or to our staff that is tirelessly working to serve those students. It is crucial to the health and learning of our students that they have access to school counselors, psychologists, and support personnel that they need in order to be successful in school. We are also cr critically understaffed in other areas. Increased workloads, growing class sizes, and staff shortages are causing educators to make the difficult choice between their career and the students that they love and their own mental and physical health. A recent survey by MSDE found that 60% of educators are more likely to leave the profession or retire earlier than planned. We cannot afford to lose any more staff members. In order to retain and recruit staff, we need to work to ensure that HCPSS salaries are competitive. We also need to ensure that the workload on staff members is sustainable. When I started teaching in Howard County 17 years ago, there was a paraeducator assigned to each grade level in elementary school. Now, paraeducators are often split between two or three grade levels, in addition to covering classes due to substitute teacher shortages. As of February 1st, there were 22 teacher vacancies, 14 paraeducator vacancies, and 40 student assistant vacancies in Howard County. We are having trouble filling the existing, existing vacancies, let alone any additional positions if we lose additional staff. The increased demands and workload on our staff needs need to, need to address by increasing salaries and positions. As caseloads, 
Okay, I'll finish up. Um, while my testimony is alarming, the good news is you can make a difference. The time is now to fill these funding needs. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your prioritization. Up next, we have Mel Taylor followed by Jacqueline Turner. Stand by. Then I'm muted. Mel? Yes, hi, good evening. My name is Mel Taylor, resident um, in Howard County. I recently had the opportunity to learn more about Howard County's complete street vision. The vision, as noted in the policy, says that Howard County is to ensure a place for individuals of all backgrounds to live and travel freely, safely, and comfortably. Um, public and private ro uh, roadways in Howard County shall, shall be safe and convenient for residents of all ages and abilities who travel by foot, bicycle, public transportation, or automobile, ensuring sustainable communities countywide. As a Howard County resident, initiatives such as this serve as another example why I'm glad our family chose to reside in Howard County. My family lives in the Honeysuckle Ridge neighborhood, which is situated within a highly de developed area off Old Skaggsville Road. The surrounding communities are filled with beautiful, diverse people, Growing families, including multi-generational households and fur babies of all kind. As I travel up and down Old Skaggsville Road, which is the main thoroughfare, I am anxious for those who are traveling on foot. Caregivers with strollers, elderly, doggers, runners, walkers, students, and public service work workers. Some may call it overthinking or overcautious. I, however, cannot shake the awful feeling I get when people are unsafe. Call it the mama bear in me or a deeply concerned resident. In the two years we've lived in our home, I've watched bus stops double and triple in size, resulting in the need for our local schools to reassess their transportation routes. Understanding the nuances in transportation needs for elementary and middle schools compared to high schoolers is both exciting and unnerving. As they grow physically, their social needs will too, and they will want to visit their neighboring friends and eventually will be driving the same roads that have nearly zero room for error. The five elements that make up Howard County Complete Street Policy, which was passed unanimously on October the 17th in 2019, are sidewalks, curb ramps, roadway, crosswalks, and grass buffer. Of the five elements, some areas on Old Skaggsville Road do not have even one of those elements. I urge us not to allow a tragedy to catalyze action on improving the walking and conditions, the walking and driving conditions on Old Skaggsville Road. I would like to wrap up my te uh, my testimony by saying uh, this: My direct ask is for funding for design, land acquisition, and construction for sidewalks and multi-use paths to include the already identified components of complete and safe streets for all Howard County residents. I would like to take a second to thank Councilwoman Rigby, Rigby District 3 for being a strong advocate for walkability and bikeability in our county and community. She, along with Colette Jeswick and Felix, um, have been incredible partners in representing Howard County. Councilwoman Rigby, as a member serving on the, count, excuse me, on the county's complete street implementation team, and backed unanimously by the Howard County Council, we eagerly anticipate the improvements and believe that you can do it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Up next, we have Jacqueline Turner followed by Paul Casey. One moment, please. I wanted to talk to you about my, um, I'm a parent of an adult with disabilities and he currently goes, is a participate in um, a day program. But the problem is it runs from when before COVID, it ran from 8 a.m. to 2. So it was very difficult for me to be able to work full time because I needed to find care for him afterwards. And it's a problem not just for me, but other parents of adults with disabilities that the day programs don't provide any aftercare services. And that's a big problem. Now, fortunately, I was able to retire, but everybody doesn't have that ability. And so that's a big problem. And it's a big hole in support of persons with disabilities in our county. And hopefully we can um, provide funding to DDA 
or so that these programs can um, expand and get more employees so that they can provide aftercare services for adults with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Paul Casey followed by Jack Garneri. One moment, please. Paul's been unmuted. Paul? Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Ball and Mr. Sid and Mr. Robbins and Dr. Sun. Uh, it's my privilege tonight to represent the Housing Affordability Coalition, 69 individuals and organizations that, as you know, advocate for affordable housing for very low, low and moderate income families in our county. Tonight, I bring messages of appreciation and expectation in four areas. First, let me begin by offering our appreciation for your administration's outstanding success in mitigating evictions and foreclosures resulting from county residents who lost income and sometimes their jobs because of this COVID pandemic. Over the past two years, $28 million has been used to keep the wolf from the doors of almost 2,500 families. Successful efforts that are a model for the nation. Thank you. The courts, however, as you know, are now beginning to process evictions and foreclosures, and too many families continue to face financial hardship caused by lost wages, increased rents, and pandemic-associated crises. We know DHCD expects to receive more state and federal funds to help these families who still need eviction and foreclosure prevention assistance. We ask that you evaluate with DHCD's assistance any potential unmet need and make provision in your proposed budget for a reserve should it be needed beyond the anticipated state and federal funding. Second, the coalition strongly supports the funding included in the capital budget to keep the affordable housing plan for downtown Columbia moving forward in a timely manner. As we all know, building the North Columbia Fire Station and redeveloping the Banneker Fire Station will not only ensure quality fire services for our growing community, but also enable the creation of 100 new units of senior housing, which will bring affordable and accessible housing to our underserved and needy senior population. Additionally, we applaud your funding commitment to keep the new Central Library on schedule. It's the keystone to adding mixed income communities at both the new and current library sites. The capital budget will ensure that the promise of 900 affordable housing opportunities in downtown will in fact become a reality. As you know, we're off to a meaningful start with 29 families currently housed at Juniper through Live Where You Work, another 30 at Marlowe, leasing the summer, and 172 planned for the Artist Flats, Lakefront North, and with your support, the newly expanded Live Where You Work program. Third, we strongly support including funds in the proposed budget for the additional DHCD staff member to manage the rehab loan program. The coalition recognizes the unanticipated burden that the pandemic has placed upon staff across all our county offices. We particularly appreciate the extraordinary work of DHCD Director Simino and her staff, along with taking on the unexpected Herculean tasks of acquiring and dispersing state and federal eviction and foreclosure monies that kept needy families in their homes. They also managed to keep moving forward, often navigating legislative and community hurdles with programs and projects that chipped away at our county's huge and growing affordable housing gap. The requested new staff position is critical to ensuring the department can continue its excellent work. And finally, this brings me to the coalition's expectation that your operations budget will include significant meaningful new monies to seed the Housing Opportunities Trust Fund. We reiterate our strongly held position presented during your December budget hearing that the anticipated two years of revenue surpluses offer an unprecedented opportunity to implement the trust, one of the priority recommendations of the Housing Opportunities Master Plan. Along with this meaningful investment of new money, we're also asking that the administration share with the council, housing advocates in our community how DHCD will operationalize the trust. This will ensure the trust can be used as soon as possible to help provide quality rental units and home ownership opportunities that are affordable to Howard County families. The coalition believes the trust is an essential vehicle for seriously addressing our county's ever widening housing affordability gap. And we thank you, Dr. Ball, for your critical, bold support in 2021 for the creation of the trust. By analogy, it's like we've been given a shiny new SUV that can take us anywhere, but now we need to be sure that the GPS is installed to let us know where we're going, and there's fuel in the tank to get us there. Otherwise, the new vehicle sits in the garage, unused and useless. So the coalition urges the next bold step to fund and place the trust in service. 
We're confident that with all interested parties working together, the trust vehicle can be operational by July 1 to coincide with the General Assembly's and the governor's actions establishing the trust in this 2022 session. Thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Ball, and as always, our coalition members stand ready to assist in furthering the county's affordable housing agenda. Don't hesitate ever to call on us whenever you think we can be of help. And thank you for all that you and your staff and administration have done on behalf of affordable housing. Thank you so much for your testimony and your advocacy and your partnership. Thank you. Up next, we have Jack Garnieri, followed by Jennifer Hurston. Jack's been unmuted. Jack? Hey. Good evening, Dr. Ball and staff. Uh, this marks the 10th year that I've testified at budget hearings in support of bicycling and pedestrian accessibility improvements. This time I'm representing a new organization. Bike Howard Inc. is a successor to the Bicycling Advocates of Howard County. We're now a 501c3 nonprofit, but we're still representing over a thousand cyclists and several uh, local cycling clubs and groups. There are several items relating to the budget that I wanted to support. Uh, Horizon Foundation is our partner in Streets for All Coalition uh, and in ensuring the implementation of bike and walk Howard master plans and complete streets. They identified almost $5.7 million uh, in this year's budget for bicycle and pedestrian uh, projects. This will mark the fourth year of your administration that funding has increased significantly for alternative transportation. We strongly support full funding for all bicycling and pedestrian accessibility projects. This is a relatively small percentage of the budget, but provides a significant return on investment in both quality of life and traffic mitigation that it provides. On bicycle funding, uh, in particular, the Office of Transportation proposed $800,000 in addition uh, to the K5066 budget uh, which is for Bike Howard Express. This will finally enable significant construction projects uh, to be made that will include complete streets for Oakland Mills, uh, road, Cedar Lane Pathway, installing a countywide bicycle wayfinding system, as well as funding 100% final design for the long planned Clarksville Streetscape project that will enable Route 108 in downtown Clarksville to be walkable and uh, rideable by bicycles, but consisting funding needs to be provided for the next two fiscal years to finally complete by Coward Express. In addition, another $600,000 was proposed for T7108, which is, uh, of which 500K is uh, MDOT Bikeways grant. Uh, that's to improve the Columbia part of the Patuxent Branch Trail, and we fully su uh, support that funding. I also want to provide support for funding DPW uh, highways for road paving and maintenance. These, these are critical to many bike uh, infrastructure improvements. In addition, Bike uh, HOCO recognizes that planning and implementing complete streets will require additional staffing and administrative systems that will also need to be funded now and in the future. Finally, I wanted to get to uh, to a, a local issue, the, there was a recent sale of uh, the locally owned race pace bicycles. Alex Obrick uh, went into retirement and sold the seven shops he owned in the Baltimore region. Uh, it's the second locally owned bike shop in the county that we've lost in the last few years. Princeton Sports was the first. Both of those, uh, those shops provided significant support uh, to both the county and to nonprofits for bicycle events and uh, for other support. Uh, Race Pace is now owned by Trek Bicycles, which is a, a corporation out of, uh, out of Wisconsin that manufactures uh, bicycles and has bike shops all over the country. We've, uh, we don't know how they're going to be as far as supporting events like, uh, like Bike to Work Day. Bike Coco has also been working for several years on bicycle rest stops with recs and parks and nonprofits like the Community Ecology Institute that were partially dependent on local bike shop support. We'll need to have find new partners for such project. Recently, we worked with uh, uh, with Nina Vesu of the Inner Harbor Trust to connect her with uh, a Boy Scout 
who wanted to do his Eagle project by installing a repair station on their property at Symphony Woods adjacent to Meriwether Post. Another Eagle project is putting in a bike repair station adjacent to the HCC parking garage. Uh, we're trying to establish a long-term relationship with several of the troops in the county uh, to have partnerships that will become increasingly important if we're going to add bike repair stations and uh, facilities to complement what, uh, what you're funding in uh, complete streets and in bike accessibility. So again, thank you for your support and please fully fund the bike and pet projects. Thank you very much for your testimony. Up next, we have Jennifer Herson, followed by Maria Morrison. Jennifer's been unmuted. Jennifer? Hi. Hi. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my testimony testimony is to call your attention to the lack of updates and maintenance activity undertaken at Jeffers Hill Elementary School. Jeffers Hill was constructed in 1974 and was slated to be renovated back in 2018, which has been pushed multiple times in the years since. We were even removed from the long range plan in 2020 and added back this year, thanks to the work of the current Board of Education. However, that renovation is not slated to start until at least 2031. The school has never had a full renovation and it's turning 50 in two years. The 32 year gap between renovations is one of, if not the longest gap between renovations for any school in the county. In the 2023 county budget, I would like to request a review of the timing of this renovation as we're long overdue and in the very least, recommend funding for not only repairs, but also routine maintenance to improve the learning environment for the more than 400 students that call Jeffers Hill home. The document I included with my testimony outlines the recommended schedule for improvements and maintenance for Jeffers Hill Elementary School as a result of a facility assessment that was performed by a contractor for Howard County Public Schools back in 2009. If you see page 29, you'll see the details of those recommendations. It should also be noted that only the rooftop units have been replaced since 1999. Today, Jeffers Hills playground is in disrepair, which has resulted in one kindergartner requiring stitches. The interior walls haven't been painted since the renovation in 1999, and it badly needs it. Our chalkboards need to be replaced by whiteboards, the portable classroom in use for our GT strings and band classes turns 30 next year. We haven't had a full renovation in 23 years and documented maintenance has primarily been limited to what is broken without focus on improving the very outdated school to bring the learning environment up to modern standards or addressing teacher needs. I respectfully request that budget be opened in 2023 to address these issues so that our kids can enjoy a learning environment that is safe and supportive. And I invite you to visit Jeffers Hill and meet with our parents to discuss these and other concerns. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide this testimony for Jeffers Hill Elementary School and have a great night. Thank you and all that you do for Jeffers Hill. Up next, we have Maria Morrison, followed by Meredith Hotman wissing Maria's going to mute it. Maria? Okay. Pivot, grace, robust instruction. I've heard that a lot over the past two years. I'm Maria Morrison. I teach 11th grade English at Reservoir High School. I've taught in this county since the beginning of my career in 2003. I love what I do. I love the children. I feel like teaching keeps me young, but right now I'm exhausted. Two years ago, the schools closed, and in order for instruction to begin again, I had to learn a new way of teaching, virtual teaching. Frankly, I didn't think I could do it. Much to my surprise, I could do it, and the words of encouragement and support from my students made me realize I wasn't half bad at it. Then the start of the 2021 year rolls around, and it's announced that teachers must pivot and schools will be virtual. But for parents not to worry, teachers will provide more robust instruction. Again, I had to learn a whole new way of teaching. Not only did I have to change my delivery, I had to learn about technology. I'm still not entirely clear as to what a hotspot is, but I could help students get them. 
Because the students saw me daily, I became the resource for everything, how to get a Chromebook, how to get a Chromebook repaired, how to get their meals, how to get their meals on the weekends, how to get counseling services. It was more than simply teaching English now. In some cases, I was their one connection to the outside world. Then in February 2021, we pivot again. Now we do hybrid learning. We have longer classes and students both online and in the room. Time to learn another way. Finally, the fall arrives and everyone's back in the buildings. I hear the mantra back to normal except with masks countless times, only it isn't normal. The students haven't been in school for a year and a half and it shows their maturity is stunted at the age at which they left the building. They are overwhelmed, returning to a six period day, five days a week, over 1800 students in the building. It's more than they can handle. The school system wasn't really ready. Teachers workloads increase. We now are creating lessons to make uh, making sure all instructional materials are available both in person and online. We're holding after school office hours in for in person students and virtual office hours for those who may have COVID or are in quarantine. We are still the students point of contact for everything. The students are unfamiliar with their counselors and their administrators, so they turn to those who they see every day. The teachers. Students are suffering, families are in crisis, and schools are overwhelmed. We were there when no one else was, and families are counting on us to continue to be there. I'm asking you to fully fund the Howard County Public School System budget so that we can continue to be there. Show the community that you care about their families and their youth. Thank you. Thank you and all that you do for Reservoir. Next up, we have Meredith Hodgman Wissing, followed by Christopher Nellis. One moment, please. Sorry, just give me a moment. Mm -hmm. I don't see her. She's not present. Okay, next up we have Christopher Nellis. One moment, please. Christopher's not present. Okay, next up we have Alice Harris. Alice Harris is present. I am here. Muted. Okay, Alice? Can you okay, yes. Yep, you're up. Okay, good evening, Dr. Ball, and to your administrative and executive team. I know it's getting late, so I'm going to try to keep uh, my comments to the point. My name is Alice Harris, and I've been a resident of Howard County for the past 48 years where I've had the wonderful of experience of working with several county and community-based organizations during my former tenure as the director of Head Start in Howard County. I recently re-engaged my community-based advocacy efforts to focus on health disparities and the impact of trauma on communities of color. Just a brief statement of my family's history, which includes the impact that diabetes has had on members of my immediate an extended family, including eight of my family members, five who have passed before the age of turning 60 as a direct result of diabetes related diseases, including heart disease, kidney disease, multiple amputations and loss of vision. As such, I've recently recommitted my time and energy to not only studying the disproportionate impact diabetes has had on African-American, Latino, and indigenous communities, but also the environment and the nutritional inequities and barriers relating to accessing high quality and affordable health care, in addition to being able to access affordable and nutritious food sources that we know have a direct link to combating this disease and leading to the impactful life and sustainable health changes that are needed. Dr. Ball, please let me note that it is always, sir, a pleasure to read your executive re updates and to review the initiatives that you have championed throughout our county as it relates to education, mental health, including the development of the most the recently released Howard County Age Friendly Report Plan in partnership with the AARP. However, sir, I am here this evening asking that we please, please do not lose sight of members of our families and children and young adults that are unfortunately losing the battle related to diabetes and health related outcomes associated with this disease, especially in our minority and lower income communities. 
Even before the impact of the pandemic and rising inflation costs, families throughout pockets of our county were faced with having to decide if they could afford to shop at the food store or the dollar store in order to be able to feed their families. These issues have not only impacted families, but also members of our older adult communities who are not able to easily access farmers markets or higher end food stores to purchase fresh vegetables and fruits due to the lack of transportation and higher food costs or the availability of community based support systems that provide equitable access to these resources. Dr. Ball, I'll keep it simple. My request this evening as we do the same for those who are disproportionately suffering from and dying from a disease that can serve be decreased throughout our community through targeted health education, implementing creative resource and care options similar to what we've seen in other states and surrounding counties, and most importantly, our ability to bring together the collective energy of so many community organizations and providers who are committed to addressing diabetes with the support of your administration. I'm going to end it there, sir, and say thank you, Dr. Ball. I look forward to working with you as you continue the incredible initiatives that you're putting forth. I know you're recognizing this health disparity, especially with regard to um, African Americans and communities of color. And I just say, sir, I hope you will open up or extend the opportunity to meet with community organizations who are there to work with you side by side in our communities. We can do better. We will do better. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your testimony. Thank you. And on that note, we have reached the halfway point. Next up, we have Mike Mitchell, followed by Elizabeth Napoda. Mike's been unmuted. Mike? Thank you, Dr. Ball and uh, Howard County colleagues. Um, Dr. Ball, nearly seven days ago, Luminous had the pleasure of hosting you at our Afghan Welcome Center. Uh, which for our other uh, attendees is where Luminous is working hard with volunteers and nonprofits to help Afghans uh, come to the United States. Now, the Afghans that you met last week uh, have been in Howard County already for several months. And thanks to your support and your administration, volunteers and other nonprofits, we are making a profound difference for them as we seek to do for all immigrants across Howard County. Only three days later, we facilitated a health clinic for these Afghans in the county um, uh, by a provider, a health provider that allowed us to use their clinic at no cost because it was closed for the weekend. A woman who presented as pregnant and in her, in her second trimester was evaluated by two physicians. Evaluation led both physicians to conclude that there was a likelihood of fetal demise or molar pregnancy. We took the patient to the emergency department at Howard Hospital following the clinic, and fortunately, the baby is alive and well. Unfortunately, though, the lack of access to prenatal care since their arrival in Maryland led to traumatic weekend for the patient and potentially a significant bill from the hospital. This story is why I'm testifying tonight. There are many worthy causes, and I could certainly talk at nauseum about Luminous and the good work we're doing. But that wouldn't happen without partnerships and that wouldn't happen with wraparound, without wraparound support. So tonight I'm asking for your support for a substantive investment in the Howard County Maternity Partnership. In 2019, nearly 20, about 12% of Hispanic mothers and 8% of black mothers in the county received late or no prenatal care. In 2019, of that reported data, less than half of the pregnant Hispanic women received prenatal care during the first trimester, compared with more than 80% of white pregnant women. In 2019, there were 10 deaths of black infants and toddlers under four uh, years of age in Howard County. As a percentage of live births, that's nearly three times as many deaths as white infants and toddlers. We are asking you tonight to invest $1 million in the 23 budget to support the creation of this maternity partnership program. Other programs exist in the state. Montgomery County has offered an effective maternity partnership program with area hospitals that provides prenatal care to uninsured pregnant women. Over the past several years, going back to 2009, there have been huge decreases in public health investments. From 73 million to 69 million the following year to a permanent cut before the General Assembly of 37 million and in 2011. 
Um, as a result of this program um, in, in Montgomery County, 90% of the women uh, of, uh, born uh, to the partnership were, were born at a healthy weight. Um, we believe that with this investment, um, we'll make a huge difference. It's estimated that more than 300 pregnant women that might qualify for these services a year in Howard County uh, which would cost the Howard County government $300,000 and also an additional $700,000 to ensure wraparound services. As we sit here tonight, you are hearing from lots of worthy institutions seeking your support for funding in the next budget cycle. As you listen, one thing I'd like to ask you to consider is not just how you can help these institutions, but also how you can institutionalize change for generations beyond just one year. Your support of this investment in the maternity partnership program will matter next year and for decades to come. We are grateful at Luminous for your leadership and constant efforts to make Howard County welcoming for immigrants, for the mothers, the fathers, and the children who choose to live and work here. With this step, you'll be making another effort, another input, another change for, for mothers and children yet to come. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your testimony. Up next, we have Elizabeth Napoda, followed by Brittany Kumchu. Elizabeth is not present. Okay, next up we have Brittany Kumchu. Brittany is not present. Okay, next up we have Sue Ann Shafley. Sue is present and Sue Ann. 2021 Attaway hope to expand services to include sibling programming so students who have a sibling with special needs could also have psychological supports they need. Unfortunately, that was not possible due to the fact my duties as executive director must be focused very heavily on raising monies to support general operations of Attaway's already operating programs. Consequently, this leaves little time to spearhead the creation of new mental health programming. Therefore, Attaway, Camp Attaway is requesting County Executive Dr. Ball recognized the 24-7 stress that families who have children with complex emotional behavioral disorders face. Parents in such circumstances have their own psychological disorders, including PTSD. Because of the violence Hey, Sue Ann, you're going in and out. It's hard. It's hard to hear you. We can't hear you at all, Sue Ann. There are. Hey, Sue Ann, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we can't hear you. So please make sure to email us your testimony also. And maybe just can we email her or something? Okay. Okay. Um, our team is reaching out to you, Sue Ann. Um, we'll move on to Thomas Peters. One moment, please. Yeah. Thomas, been unmuted. Thomas. Thank you, and good evening. My name is Tom Peters. I'm the vice president of the board of directors at Wyndham Condominiums in uh, the heart of Columbia here, and I speak as the unanimous voice of our community. I agree completely with what Mr. Krasnick said earlier, so consequently to, I'm speaking against the proposal to build apartments atop the new fire station seven. Robin Sharma, one of the world's top uh, leadership experts said, when you don't keep your word, you lose credibility. Whether it comes to business or your personal life, there's something to be said about those who keep 
their word. And a current Republican congressman said, of course, a politician's promise isn't worth the paper it's written on. Well, we hope that doesn't apply here. In our community, we have invested millions of dollars in our homes, many of us planning on this being our last home. Well, why did we do that? Largely because of the quiet environment embraced by green space that was dedicated as such and promised as such by politicians, planners, and developers. And consequently, we knew they could not build upon it. And we do love our firehouse and have no objection to it being modernized or even rebuilt. It adds peace and security to our lives. And actually in September of 2015, because of its proximity to our property, uh, many of the firefighters were able to run over to our uh, complex here and actually start rescuing people before the five alarm fire that destroyed a building before the trucks were even out of the bay. So we were much appreciative of that. And we appreciate the uh, security that that adds, not only for fire, but the fact that it's a fueling station and a lot of the police are there all the time as well. But what we strenuously object to is the building of any residential units above the firehouse. The fact is that if we talk about a need for residential units, in Howard County, there's a 7.6 vacancy rate of rental units. Whereas in the state of Maryland, it's 6.3. So that's a 1.3% greater rate than in the rest of Maryland. And in the United States, a 5% vacancy rate. So the vacancy rate for rental properties in Howard County is 2.6% greater than it is throughout the country. So where there may be a need for some rental properties, certainly we don't need to put something in the place here where it would cause additional problems. Now, in Columbia, we're still optimistic that the pioneering uh, community that we love still embodies the community spirit that attracted us here in the first place, and that it continues to bind us as a community. And we're hopeful and confident that the voice and the will of the citizens will be heard loud and clear. Wyndham Condominium is a garden-style, quiet community nestled quietly and protectively behind the fire station surrounded by quiet green space and woods, which is juxtaposed peaceful place in walking distance from the urban center of Columbia. Now, all the documents that we received when we purchased our homes also provided proof that this area was not even included in the original downtown redevelopment plan, so the residents could confidently rear their children or enjoy their retirement in a peaceful, tranquil surroundings without ever having to be uh, surrounded by additional building, particularly something as uh, 100 extra units, virtually doubling the size of our uh, residents in this area. Now, I mentioned that we fully agree with what Mr. Krasnick said earlier, but we recognize too that the additional traffic would be a hardship on the people here, that it would cause tremendous amount of backlog and uh, traffic congestion in the area, which is already terrible, especially around the Christmas time when the lines have already backed up beyond our uh, village here and in the uh, Banneka Road area. So traffic is a terrible situation here, as mentioned, and regardless of what plan we have, there is still only one entrance in and one exit out of our small dead-end community. Lines on a map don't communicate the impact that this plan will have on the communities in, uh, affected. So in the short time, it's impossible to adequately express the depth of concern and opposition the current residents have toward this proposal. And we're confident that the wisdom of not allowing this project to go forward will join the wisdom of recognizing the will of the people and disregard this project. Thank you. For your testimony. Up next, we have Teresa Webster, followed by Jeff Richmond and Larry Schoen. Teresa's been unmuted. Teresa? Can you hear me? We Hello? can. You're up. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Teresa Webster. This is my 32nd year teaching, 22nd in Howard County, 
The last 12 as a reading specialist. And I love what I do, working daily in grades K through five, identifying needs, providing interventions, tracking progress. I take little planning time and 20 minutes to eat lunch while I check my messages. And I take things home, just like most teachers. If you've ever watched the parking lot of an elementary school, it looks more like an airport. People pulling rolling bags and crates, carrying heavy totes. Continually more is added to teachers' plates, yet rarely is anything removed. Though we never stop trying to do the best we can. Last year, I taught 12 different lessons each day in all grades. 12 classes plus 12 different preps. Fortunately, this year we have another reading specialist, but only for half the day. She's a blessing to our school, particularly to me. Now I teach nine different groups every day. My partner sees five groups every morning, then travels to her other school. We don't have time to discuss students, data, schedules, school, reading topics. Together we teach 14 intervention groups, but still others identified by the Dibble screener would benefit from a specific intervention with us. The State's Ready to Read Act requires screening of all kindergartners and first graders not previously screened for early intervention and phonemic and phonic skills. This year, HCPSS requires all students K through five to be tested, screened three times a year. Students scoring below a designated level also take two progress checks between those three screenings. Much of this test is given to students individually. This takes time, adding to the classroom teachers and reading specialists to-do list. Our middle of the year Dibble screening identified 129 students needing supplemental reading instruction. Many reading specialists, especially schools without Title I positions, share similar challenges. We, reading specialists, can't provide intervention lessons Risa? for all. Exceptional you teachers at our all. school work hard providing supplemental instruction in small groups. Our dedicated paraeducators Risa? also work with students. We make sure students Last get thing we heard additional was many help. Reading specialists? Just not all can be with a reading specialist. Those of us with... All right, we'll make sure to be in touch and uh, ask you to email the rest of your testimony in. And thank you. Okay, up next we have Jeff Richman followed by Larry Schoen. One moment, please. Jeff's been unmuted. Jeff? Hi, everyone. Thank you. My name is Jeff Richmond, a homeowner on Stonebrook Lane in Columbia. Uh, I'm a proud husband of a 2004 Hammond High School graduate and a proud father. Uh, please stand by. Sure. Make sure not to cross mics. Jeff, can you hear us? Yes, we were having some technical difficulties. You're up. of 2038. Uh, I'm here speaking this evening to discuss the importance of improving the crosswalk on Guilford Road near Blue Sea Drive, directly across from Hammond High School. Um, I live in Stonebrook Lane, a town, a town home community very close to this When we go for a walk on the paths, which we do almost daily, over 95% of the time, we go on a path connected to our neighborhood and choose not to go across Guilford Road, even though that crosswalk that I'm here speaking about is closer to our home. Uh, unless you yourself have attempted to walk on that crosswalk since 
no way to fully understand how daunting and dangerous it can be. Barely go on that crosswalk, uh, especially with our daughter, because it is not worth the risk, which precludes us from going on close walks to more paths to the high school across the street and to our fantastic village. The problem, from which I can tell, is the visibility of people waiting on the north side when a car is coming from broken. It's not very visible, and I believe people drive faster than they should. Oftentimes, I'll see one direction of traffic stop for a pedestrian while the other side, other side continues to drive through, even when someone starts to walk across it. That creates an extremely dangerous trans and the drivers. And I think it can be avoided and it should be avoided. I honestly think it's a catastrophe waiting to happen and the county should act for anything to happen. In general, I find this portion of Guilford Road sidewalk to be unsafe considering how many kids and families are walking walk along it, especially students walking to the high school. The sidewalk is very close to faster than vehicles with speed cameras that come and go on the other seem to be there sometimes and sometimes they're not. And that sidewalk connects Cannon High School to the Kings Contriver Village Center, many neighborhoods and in many neighborhoods. I do think however that, that crosswalk is more imperative than the sidewalk itself. I do realize that this crosswalk is primarily used by residents who live on Blue Sea Drive and Stonebrook Lane, which is less than 150 miles. But for Columbia and Howard County to continue to be an attractive, safe, and fantastic place to live, I think our leaders need to focus on issues, on issues such as this. And I do appreciate your time this evening to speak on the issue. And I do hope also that you take the time to understand my concerns, as I know I share them with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Up next, we have Larry Stone followed by Karen. One moment, please. Larry's been unmuted. Hi, good evening, Dr. Ball and county staff. Um, this is Larry Schoen. I'm speaking for myself tonight. My testimony <clears throat> is, however, informed by my service on the Complete Streets Implementation Team. Uh, chair of the Multimodal Transportation Board and a member of BICOCO. Um, but this is my own testimony. So first of all, thank you um, for all of the support for the budgets for biking and walking multimodal transportation. I would like to uh, keep those budget lines uh, healthy. Uh, as you've heard in much of the testimony, it's echoed in a lot of the testimony tonight. In particular, K5066 and K5061, the um, the bike plan and pedestrian plan implementation, and just a, a you know suggestion if we're not already doing it, particular items that run multi years or that are over a million dollars, probably we want to pull those out as separate budget items uh, so we can track them better. Um, also, support speaking in support of the uh, the T level projects, the T category projects for intersections and trails, those greatly impact. Uh, pedestrians and bikes, and the H projects for resurfacing. Those give us a lot of the opportunities to put in uh, bike lanes on our roads. Um, you know, one of the advantages, you may not consider an advantage of being late in the testimonies, I get to hear what a lot of other people say. So just to echo some of the things, because my ears tuned to it, gaps in sidewalks, crash on Stevens Forest, traffic out of control, people in affordable housing having problem paying for gas, uh, complete streets testimony, people wanting to visit friends as they mature, housing affordability, the impact, you know, parking is a significant part uh, and, and automobile access. If we can get multimodal, we can get more affordable housing, traffic and backlogs. So a lot of what we, what I'm speaking in favor of multimodal transportation, we need some density. We're getting that in, in, in downtown Columbia, but we need the links that uh, link us to the rest of the, uh, the the region and within that region. We're doing a great job. We just need to do better. Um, on the operating budget side, uh, we need, obviously need money for education. Y you've heard that the, there are existing gaps. Um, the engineers we have at, are, are great at building roads for cars. They need education in other areas. We also need funding on the Office of Transportation, as Jack said to do some concept planning for projects that come up. I don't think we've ever done a walkability audit. You know, these, these are the kinds of things in the operating budget we could use. DPW needs operating budget to maintain uh, maintain the crosswalks, uh, maintain 
the new bike lanes that we're getting. So uh, in closing, why this is all important, because it provides access. Uh, we've been stuck in our, in our homes and maybe not getting into our offices, but providing equitable access to everybody in the county is essential uh, as we move forward into the new world of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much, Rita. Up next, we have Sarah Boyce, followed by Daniela. Sharon's been unmuted. Hello, good evening, Dr. Ball and members of the cabinet. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Sharon Boyce. My family moved to Columbia in 1969. And I thank you for this opportunity to share my comments on the 2023 budget. I'm here tonight to ask you to please consider replacing any proposed stream restoration projects that deforest the riparian zone and excavate the stream banks away to connect the stream to creative floodplains with environmentally friendly techniques that capture upland stormwater runoff where is occurring. I recognize that our ever increasing amount of loss of forest for developed and paved over surface has caused a stormwater runoff situation that requires mitigation. But after millions of dollars have been spent over the past several years removing mature forests and degrading natural streams, I find myself questioning the benefits of this destructive practice. I feel the trade-offs have not been worth the losses. I also recognize that municipalities have obligations to obtain required TMDL credits. It's become common knowledge that stream restorations produce the most bang for the buck, but that doesn't mean they are the best answer. These projects attempt to mitigate the stormwater control issue in the middle of it at great expense to our pocketbooks, our environment, and our quality of life. I propose we reallocate funding that is earmarked for stream restorations in addition to any funding we receive for stream restorations to be spent on educating the public on the urgency and necessity of capturing stormwater runoff and silt and sediment where it is occurring with out of stream techniques that capture, filter, slow and cool the runoff before it enters the streams while providing ecological uplift and enhance our quality of lives instead. I believe methods such as rain gardens by retention ponds and swales, rain barrels and pervious pavement are the answer to reducing silt and sediment in the streams along with plantings and the like. The county should work with the Columbia Association, other homeowners associations and residents in identifying areas that need immediate mitigation. The county could perform the work or provide funding through grants, rebates or tax credits. And in a new study for the, by the Center for the Watershed Protection shows by mitigating runoff before it enters the stream that even very steep eroded banks can begin to revegetate and self-recover in as little as 13 months. Preserving our mature forests and natural streams along with additional plantings of four layers of forest is critical to mitigate the impacts of global warming. Additionally, I would like Howard County to start a green streets program like Montgomery County has. I believe this will be common infrastructure with our children today who buy homes in the future. Why not teach them about that this and prepare them for their future now? Why do we have to lose more native flora and fauna and our quality of life in mature established neighborhoods? I'm also opposed to spending money to cut dead tree snags down in the middle Patuxent environmental area. They're a critical part of the ecosystem. And I too have concerns about development and easements in Columbia. I echo the concerns on the fire station. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Dean Maniello, followed by John McCain. Dean is not present. And next up, we have John McCain. One moment, please. John's been unmuted. John? Hi. Just doesn't show that I'm unmuted on my end. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, my name is John McGing, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I um, did submit written testimony and will try to do this as briefly as possible. Uh, my wife and I are both retired, and we have a 30 year old son who is intellectually disabled, and he still lives with us and likely will for another decade. I'd like to remind people that our special needs students who will likely live and work in Howard County after they leave the public school system. So, although I support we get those uh, special needs uh, aides and teachers 
Um, we need to look at these citizens once they leave the system and they're in our community living, living amongst us. So I want to voice my, the support my wife and I have for the therapeutic recreation programs that are offered by the Department of Recreation and Parks that serve these citizens. These are very unique programs. Not very many places in this country offer programs like these. It's therapeutic recreation is a small piece of what recreation and parks does, but it is, like I said, fairly unique. And it serves a small and a very specialized population. But in Howard County, it's it's a wonder, it's marvelous that this often overlooked group actually does have access to specialized, popular, and successful recreation programs um, available to meet them where they are. Um, we would like to see therapeutic recreation fully funded or even better so that it can return to its pre-COVID vigor. It needs to have the resources, which includes staffing, that's necessary to meet the recreation needs of these special citizens of Howard County. Now we know nothing exists in a vacuum and we understand and appreciate just how well Howard County funds recreation programs um, for everyone. It makes part of what makes living here so wonderful. But we wanted to raise our voice specifically on behalf of people like our son who cannot speak for himself and for the many families and caregivers who are simply too involved with their daily living activities to find the time to speak out at events such as this. We don't represent them formally, but we stand in front of a large line of, of similar parents and caregivers. So we ask that you recognize the uniqueness and value of the therapeutic recreation program that our Department of Recreation and Parks has and ensure that it is fully funded and resourced. And for that, I thank you and have a great night. Tracy, can you hear us? Can you hear us? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, and Jean Daniello is is online. I don't know why you didn't unmute her. Um, can I go ahead? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, County Executive Ball and members of uh, the County Council. My name is Tracy Eberhardt. My address is 9625 Sea Shadow, Columbia, Maryland. I am here to um, ask you to approve full funding for the Howard County Department of Recreation and Parks, and especially the Therapeutic Rec Program. The depth and variety of the programming offered by the Howard County Rec and Parks offerings are nothing short of incredible. There is something for everyone at every age and every ability. In one of my former jobs, I worked with senior citizens who enjoyed the many offerings, especially the trips. There were, this was very important, especially those who were single without close family members. These trips allowed safe, healthy social, social interaction and often education for an affordable price. These programs greatly enriched their lives. I am a mother of a 32-year-old daughter with developmental disabilities and autism. From the time she was about 18 months old to today, she has greatly benefited from the programs offered by the Therapeutic Rec Division of the Howard County Department of Recreation and Parks. Through these programs, she learned to swim and has met lifelong friends, which is very difficult for her. The benefits of these programs include, but are not limited to, increasing social interaction, physical activity, arts experiences, and general overall enjoyment of her life. The therapeutic rec director and the employees are fantastic dealing with people with differing abilities. They are patient and kind. 
assuring everyone enjoys the activities and are safe. Offered our activities for young children all the way through adulthood at affordable prices. These programs make up significant part of my daughter's life. She typically participates in two to three programs a week. Without these programs, she would most likely sit at home in front of the television, which she does not really interact with. It is very difficult to find activities for adults with differing abilities in which they feel accepted and are treated with respect. I cannot begin to tell you the difference these programs through recreation and parks have made in the lives of our family. It is a large reason to stay in Howard County as our permanent residence as we move toward retirement. Please fully fund these programs which enrich the lives of so many. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you and have a good evening also. Now we're gonna go back to Sue Ann Shapley. Sue Ann's been unmuted. Sue Ann. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sue Ann Shapley and I'm the executive director of Camp Attaway. Attaway has for over 26 years provided a therapeutic summer camp for children with complex emotional and behavioral challenges, as well as biweekly parent education and support groups that are facilitated by a child psychologist and provided free of cost. Attaway's camp serves children ages 7 to 13 and also provides a counselor and training program for those ages 13 to 15. Attaway's biweekly parent education and support groups are facilitated by a child psychologist who teaches parenting tools and coping strategies to help parents more effectively manage their child's behaviors and support their own mental health needs brought on by the stress, isolation, and judgment they frequently feel as a result of parenting a child with complex behavioral disorders. As everyone is aware, the need for mental health services across the county country and also in Howard County remain underserved. NIMH reports that out of, ten, out of the tens of millions of people affected by mental health illness, less than half receive any treatment in their entire lifetime. Individuals with comprehensive mental health needs have few options, oftentimes because providers in private practice don't accept insurance and expect to be paid at the time when services are rendered. Research further shows that one half of all mental health issues start before the age of 14. Unaddressed childhood mental health issues change brain chemistry, further complicating a child's development, choices, and behavior. Direct supports for these complex issues are few and far between, but Howard County is fortunate to have award-winning, very unique programs that are specifically designed to support these children and their families. Additionally, Attaway provides teaching and mentoring to its staff so that the behavior management skills they learn at Attaway can be used in our schools, recreation programs, and counseling programs in the community, extending Attaway's impact. All too often, the children that Attaway serves have poor self-confidence because they have failed in the classroom and after-school programs and in summer camps. Because of their inability to manage their behaviors, they frequently are sent home for aggressions to sell for others and all too often have never made a friend until they attend Camp Attaway. Most of the campers that attend Attaway have multiple diagnoses that include emotional disturbance, autism, and other psychiatric conditions. Their families are overwhelmed by mental health issues that can include suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts, and aggressive behaviors to self and others. Often these children require hospitalizations and even police interventions. At Attaway, we maintain a two-to-one camper to highly trained staff ratio, hiring special education teachers, counselors, behaviorists, and those pursuing graduate degrees in psychology while having a child psychologist on site at all times so a team of talented staff can prevent or intervene in real time and diffuse or manage disruptive behaviors. At Attaway, campers' self-confidence blossoms as children learn how to recognize their emotions and manage their behaviors. Research shows that the negative effects people feel as a result of the pandemic will continue to necessitate additional mental health services and enhanced supports to keep families healthy, not just during the acute phase of the pandemic, but also post-pandemic. 
Can you imagine how onerous this is to the already overwhelmed families Attaway serves? In 2021, Attaway hoped to expand services to include sibling programs so students who have siblings with special needs could also have psychological psychological supports they need. Unfortunately, that was not possible due to the fact that my duties at ex as executive director must be focused very heavily on raising monies to support general operations of current Attaway programs. Therefore, Camp Attaway is requesting the county executive ball recognize the 24-7 stress and allocate $25,000 more in additional funding for the coming year and also recognize that this funding is needed in ongoing years as well. Without Attaway programs operating in Howard County, parents who already operate under unmanageable levels of stress would lack the vital supports that allow them to breathe and keep their heads above water. Thank you, Dr. Ball and your staff for your consideration. And I apologize for speaking so quickly, but I had a lot to say. <laughs> Thank you so much for your testimony, and we appreciate all that you did have to say. And with that, we're going to go back to Jean Daniela. Okay. Hello? Can, can hey, you hear Jean. me? Yep. Oh, I feel so much happier. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm here to testify, and I want to appreciate, appreciate you listening. My name is Jean Daniello, and I live in Columbia, Maryland, and I am testifying in support of full funding for recreation and parks operating in capital budgets. These programs form a major part of my family's life. As you may know, I support two adult daughters with intellectual disabilities who rely on these programs for therapeutic opportunities to learn, interact with others in appropriate ways, reduce loneliness, and interact with the greater community that is otherwise closed to them. They are unable to live alone or drive or cook or complete most normal activities that we take for granted. Therapeutic parks and recreation programs help to keep my daughters mentally and physically healthy and open a door to a more normal, equitable, and inclusive life. These programs are essential to the developmentally disabled participants they serve as senior centers and community centers are for our county residents and are part of what makes Howard County an attractive place to live. Through cooking classes, they are safe in the kitchen and can assist me or their personal care staff in activities and allow them to have greater control over their lives. This would not be possible without the therapeutic programs they have participated in. Recreation and Parks operates many facilities that are heavily used such as Laura's Place Playground. This playground and all others must be maintained for safety for all children, and this playground is special, designed to be safe for children and adults with special needs. Laura's Place Playground, named after Laura Weatherald, longtime employee of Howard County Parks and Rec, a friend and longtime advocate of individuals with special needs, must be maintained as a premier playground that it is. State of Maryland passed into law the public facilities um, law that requires adult changing tables so everyone with personal care needs can be um, taken care of in a dignified way. This means that the facilities must undergo renovations to meet the law. I understand it's costly, but really it must be done. Any one of us could be in that situation. So Howard County, it's a beautiful place to live. I want to stay here. Let's help keep it that way for everybody, not just some of us, but all citizens. Thank you so much for your attention. And please, please include recreation and parks in your budget. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your perseverance tonight, Jean. <laughs> yes, thank you. And thanks for everything, everybody. I know you all work very hard. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Up next, we'll have we have Brent Loveless followed by John Perico. Brent is not present. Okay, uh, we'll move to John. John is not present. Okay, next up we have Danielle Barron. Danielle's been unmuted. Danielle, 
Hello, good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good evening, County Executive Dr. Calvin Ball, Mr. Robbins, and Dr. Son. My name is Danielle Duran Barron. I've been a resident of Howard County for the last 14 years. I'm also the co-chair of Alianza Latina Work Group, established by County Executive Ball to promote the values of diversity and civilities and to work with county agencies, nonprofit organizations, and other community groups to facilitate an environment of inclusion, communication, understanding, and respect throughout the county. I'm giving testimony today to ask that you include $1 million in your budget for the fiscal year 23 to support the creation of a maternity partnership program. Mike Mitchell was here earlier tonight, and I joined him in my request. We need to keep building towards equity in prenatal and postpartum care. The statistics, the statistics tell us the inequities that currently exist. In 21, 14% of Black residents and 11% of Hispanic residents reported having no health insurance, compared to 4% of White residents. In 19, almost 12% of Hispanic mothers and 8% of Black mothers in the county receive late or no prenatal care. In the case of Hispanic mothers, that's more than four times the percentage of white mothers. In 2019, of the reported data, less than half of pregnant Hispanic women, like myself, received prenatal care during the first trimester compared to more than 80% of white pregnant women. There have been massive cuts in funding to our public health infrastructure. The Board of Public Works cut fiscal year 2019 funding from 73 million to 69 million. And the following year, the Maryland General Assembly made a permanent cut to reset public health funding at 37.3 million in fiscal year 2011. Since then, the funding has not recovered, which led to the elimination of essential services and programs like the Howard County Health Department prenatal clinic that closed over 10 years ago. Howard County's Racial Equity Test Force recommended that the county fund establish a maternity partnership model after the Montgomery County to better health outcomes in Howard County. If created, this partnership program could benefit 300 pregnant women annually in Howard County. In our final report, La Alianza Latina also recommended that the county executive work with the health department to offer prenatal care through a program like the Maternal Partnership Program in Montgomery County. For many years, Montgomery County has offered an effective maternity partnership program with area hospitals that provide prenatal to in uninsured pregnant women. As a result of the program, 97% of the babies born to the partnership mothers were born in a healthy weight. In 2022, Montgomery County will pay participating hospitals $900 per pregnancy, and the hospital will collect an additional $500 from the patient as copay. We're not asking for free here. Montgomery County has a scope of work stating what services are included and not included and participating hospitals agree to cover the cost of any high risk care needed. Often participating hospitals partner with, with OBGYN practices and or community health practices like Chase Braxton to provide prenatal services. We would predict that that would happen here in Howard County as well. It's estimated that there'll be about 300 pregnant women that might qualify for these services in our county, which would cost the county about $300,000, including the cost of health department staff for overseeing the program. Experts also recommend that in-home services be provided to uninsured mothers, like the one that Mike Mitchell referred to earlier in his testimony, the African mother who just arrived in this country. Um, to uh, provide it to the uninsured mothers after birth occurs to improve early childhood outcomes. The cost of these wraparound services are estimated at about 700,000 a year. The blueprint is already available. The need is clear and the data speaks for itself. Now we need to do what's right for our community. So on behalf of Alianza Latina, I ask that you commit to these women and the future citizens of Howard County. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next up, we have Elizabeth on, followed by Kevin Taylor. Elizabeth is not present. Okay, next up, we have Kevin Taylor. I have a Kevin T that I will unmute in a moment. Kevin T is unmuted. Kevin? Yes, I'm here. Thank Hi, you. Brooke. One second. 
Uh, good evening, Dr. Ball and Howard County Council members. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my family and I have been residents in Howard County for five years. And one of the things that we've appreciated the most is the walkability of neighborhoods. We recently purchased our home and selected the area because of its proximity to friends, local businesses, and the school community that our children were attending at that time. So we reside in one of the new developments off of Old Skagsville Road, which is the main thoroughfare used to access multiple neighborhoods in the southern end of Howard County. My concern is for the safety of pedestrians who use Old Skagsville Road to transition to other neighborhoods, exercise, access High Ridge Park, or even as a bus stop for public school students. As a measure of accessibility and safety, it would be great to have sidewalks installed to allow comfortable and safe transition between the neighborhoods and to High Ridge Park without the fear of being hit by a fast moving vehicle on Old Skaggsville Road. There are currently additional housing developments being constructed in the area that will impact the traffic flow, thus increasing the safety of residents who travel by foot or bike on the road. I'm not aware of any major accidents that have occurred recently on this route. However, I certainly don't believe that we should wait for one to occur before making the necessary adjustments to ensure the safety of our most vulnerable residents, our children. Currently, the only access to High Ridge Park is by walking in the street or in the yard of a residence, and neither of those are comfortable or safe neighborhood transition. So in short, I appreciate the opportunity to bring the safety concern before the city council. And I would like to take a second to thank Councilman uh, Rigby of District 3 and the county's complete streets implementation team for being advocates for walkability and bike access in our community. I hope that this request to look into providing um, additional access for um, this area of the county to uh, transition between neighborhoods and to High Ridge Park if that will be considered and prioritize funding to support additional improvements for safety in District 3. Thank you. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Up next, we have Iris Rivera followed by Nelly Campos. Iris is not present. Okay, next up we have Nelly Campos followed by Yvette Okenda Burroughs. One moment, please. Sorry, just give me a moment. Hello, good, uh, good evening. My name is Viviana Lozano, but I'm going to be translated for Nelly Campos. She's going to do her testimony in Spanish. Okay. Buenas tardes, legisladores. Mi nombre es Nelly Campos. Hoy estoy aquí porque creo que todas las madres embarazadas deberían tener atención médica. Soy miembro de casa del condado de Jagua y una inmigrante indocumentada de El Salvador. También soy trabajador esencial, pero lo más importante es que soy madre y abuela. Es, estoy muy bendecida de tener hijas preciosas. Yo me fui de El Salvador y vine a los Estados Unidos por ella. Una de mis hijas recientemente estuvo embarazada Yo la cuidé y le ayudé durante su embarazo, ya que vivió su embarazo sin seguro médico. Madres como yo y mi hija, que somos indocumentadas y no elegibles para Medicaid, luchamos mucho por no tener el cuidado médico que necesitamos. Yo vi a mi hija durante su embarazo ir de clínica en clínica para poder recibir un poco de cuidado. Ella pudo ver a un doctor solo un par de veces antes de dar a luz y eso a mí me daba miedo. Me preocupaba su salud y la salud de mi nieto. Es un milagro que su embarazo haya resultado bien. Gracias a Dios que mi embarazo, el de mi hija, está bien. Pero no todas tenemos la misma fortuna. Los, los dos están saludables, pero mujeres indocumentadas como yo están perdiendo a sus hijos, se, se están muriendo ellas y están sufriendo de complicaciones severas. Esto está pasando todos los días y mi comunidad está sufriendo. 
legisladores, les pido que piensen en mí, en las miles de, de madres y familias como la mía. Mis hijos y mis nietos, nuestro estatus est migratorio no significa que no tengamos derecho a un doctor. Por favor, apoyen estas leyes para proteger a las madres y a los bebés. Gracias. My name is Nelly Campos. I am here today because I believe that all pregnant mothers should have health care. I am a CASA member and a resident of Howard County in an undocumented immigrant from El Salvador. An essential worker, but most importantly, I am a mother and grandmother. I am blessed to have many beautiful daughters. I fled El Salvador to come here to the U.S. for them. One of my daughters recently got pregnant. I watched her and helped her uh, through her pregnancy as she went as she went through with the without no health care because undocumented mothers like me and my daughter are not eligible for health insurance. We struggle a lot with getting the care we need. I watched my daughter during her pregnancy go from clinic to clinic to get care. She only got to see a doctor a few times before her delivery. It was scary. I was worried about her health and the health of my grandchild. It is a miracle that the pregnancy went smoothly. Thanks to God that my pregnancy and my daughter's pregnancy were good, but all not had the same fortune. Both of them are okay. But an undocumented woman like me are losing their children, dying themselves, and suffering from several complications. It happens every day in my community is suffering. Dr. Ball and legislators, I ask that you please think of me and think of the thousands of mothers and families like me, my kids and my grandkids. Our immigration status doesn't no mean that we don't deserve a right to a doctor. Please support this bill and keep the mothers and babies safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony and have a good evening. Next up, we have Yvette Acuendo Beruz, followed by Chris Oviedo. Yvette's been on mute. Yvette. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Good evening, Dr. Ball and members of the administration. It's a true honor and pleasure to be given this opportunity to speak about a cause that is very near to my heart. I am Dr. Yvette Okendo, a resident of Columbia, Maryland, with over 30 years serving the Howard County community. I would like to offer testimony in support of funding the prenatal services for all women living in Howard County. I am a veteran U.S. Army physician specializing in family medicine, past president of the Maryland Academy of Family Physician, and I am a medical director for Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield of Maryland a board trustee for the Horizon Foundation, and was a member of both the Howard County Council Racial Equity Task Force and La Alianza Latina Work Group. From 2008 to 2017, I served with Chase Braxton Healthcare Columbia Center, the only federally qualified health center in the county. This facility offers access to healthcare regardless of patient's ability to pay. During my service at Chase, I treated a considerable number of uninsured Latina pregnant women who requested prenatal care. Unfortunately, Chase Braxton did not offer prenatal care services at the Columbia office. We had to refer these patients to either the Glen Burnie or Baltimore City office. Obviously, getting to these offices is exceedingly difficult from Howard County due to lack of reliable public transportation 
These mothers to be often live in households with a single vehicle and spouses working two to three jobs, unable to routinely drive their wives for out of county care. As a physician, as a mother, as a grandmother, I find it truly perplexing that one of the wealthiest counties in the nation, recognized by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as a winner of the 2021 Culture of Health Prize for fostering health equity and inclusion, is the same county without access to essential prenatal care for all women. We hear about the importance of health equity and inclusion, but we do not offer access to affordable prenatal care to all women who are part of this vibrant Howard County community. Neighboring counties like Montgomery have found a way to implement affordable access to prenatal care by fostering partnerships among hospitals and OB providers funded by county dollars. I would like to thank you, Dr. Ball, for your commitment to reducing health inequities like lack of access to maternal and child health services. When Howard County was named finalist of the culture of health, you said that in Howard County, we remain committed to addressing disparities and creating a culture of health by leveraging partnerships, building coalitions and integrating services that can create the greatest community impact. The time is now. You have the opportunity to bring together community partners like Chase Braxton and Howard County General Hospital to solve this health care need in Howard County by creating and funding a maternity clinic and associated wraparound services for all pregnant women living in the county. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and your advocacy and your partnership. Up next, we have Chris Oviedo followed by Joel Hurwitz. Chris has been unmuted. Chris? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Dr. Ball. Uh, my name is Chris Oviedo, and I am the co-chair of Alianza Latina. Uh, tonight, I wasn't originally scheduled to speak. Um, I, I wanted to give opportunity to other voices to come and speak on behalf of the maternity program that we so urgently need here in Howard County. Um, Liz Bobo, the previous uh, Howard County executive, was going to speak on this hearing tonight. Unfortunately, she had some technical difficulties and couldn't join, and therefore I am here representing her. Uh, I know she wanted she wanted to make sure that we get the message to you, Dr. Ball, tonight, that uh, first, thanking you for taking her call earlier today, where she had the opportunity to speak with you directly about this issue and where she uh, informed you of her support and how urgently she believes and feels that we need to get this maternity program here in Howard County. Uh, we've heard tonight the stories, uh, the statistics, We've heard the voices of, of, you know, some of the Hoka residents who are going through this and the story is there, the need is there, um, the support is there. We just need uh, you, Dr. Bolt, to go ahead and write this million dollars on the budget so that we can go ahead and provide the support, the much, much, much needed support for all women who are not eligible for health insurance or may not be able to afford health insurance or for whatever reason, they may just not have access to health care. We've heard so many important issues tonight and um, many of those issues have talked about inclusion. Well, I don't think that we can get um, any more basic than including, you know, um, the health care of the moms and the babies right there from the beginning. So if we want to continue to move forward, if we want to continue to be progressive, if we, if we want to continue to really be inclusive, we need to start right there at the maternity level, making sure that all of our mothers have the care that they need and that they deserve. Um, and also, um, like I said, Liz, uh, just wanted to make sure that I got the message, her message to you. Thank you for that. She will continue to support and show her support to this initiative. She will contact you again. Uh, we'll be in touch. And uh, I thank you because I know that you are in support of this program. And I know that you are also going to, do, I believe that you're going to do everything in your power to help us um, get this to the county council and then make this a reality that will stay not just for one year or two years, but on a permanent basis here at Howard County. So thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you everybody. And if I may, gracias uh, a la señora que habló en español por su testimonio. Thank you, thank you for your bravery. We appreciate your voice um, for speaking up for all of those who are not able to. Thank you and good evening. Thank you so much, Chris. And just uh, wanna thank everyone who's serving on La Alianza Latina. 
and uh, who testified this evening from your group. Thank you. Up next, we have Joel Hurwitz, followed by Brad Butler. Joel, you muted. Joel. Good evening. You hear me? I can hear you. Uh, good evening, Dr. Ball and members of the administration. Uh, first, wanted to express support for W8336, the Longfell area water main improvements. We had a number of water main breaks. Sometimes it seemed like one a day um, a few months ago. Um, in that regard, I also recommended to the staff that for this and perhaps other projects in Columbia that you include the name of the villages because that was left out in the draft and it makes it very hard to find if you're searching through the budget because no one's going to search for Longfellow necessarily when they're looking for Harper's Choice. Um, during the recent hearing on Delegate Tross's bill on electric vehicle charging for new multifamily construction, the discussion turned to at least requiring conduit for future use to install the charges at a later date. And it occurred to me, can the county do something similar with the county-owned multifamily parking and coordinate with the multifamily condos and apartments when you're digging up the pavement for these water projects so that the charges can be installed later. North Columbia Fire Station is in the project in your cover letter every year, yet there doesn't seem to be any public discussions since it was before the Board of Ed last August when they were not very receptive to it. The DPW website sold the project at the park. Had you read the articles from a decade ago when Baltimore County tried to put a fire station park, years of delay would have been avoided as with the school you're about four or five years behind the original schedule. There's been a great reluctance to buy any of the properties along Route 108. I've been told, well, the county doesn't own them. You didn't own the Board of Ed properties either. And the $3 million that was going to go to renovating Ascend 1 or to upgrade the fields, it wasn't really free. As a member of the Harper's Choice Board, speaking for myself, I was offended by the mischaracterizations of the meeting where the project was presented just before the pandemic lockdown in your letter to the council last year. And there continue to be many misinformation regarding North Columbia and Banneker, as you heard the opposition earlier. Yet I've never seen how you, a sketch plan for the Banneker of how you're going to get uh, all the units, parking, and a fire station all in an odd shaped two acre lot. I've been advocating instead of senior housing that that might be better for affordable housing land trusts with condos and perhaps first responders would appreciate having an opportunity to live there. So I hope that you'll present the current status of the plan without being vague and without using the affordable housing as a wedge as we've done with the cultural center or again packing the North Columbia community meetings with Banneker affordable housing proponents. And I'm running out of time so I'd like to with why can't we save the portion of Phoenix over the Tiber culvert? I documented to the Historic Preservation Commission how the Tiber wall, the contours of the Tapsco Bridge, and the Jersey wall serve to raise the water level in the portion of Main Street, and that the that portion of the building is not an impediment to the safe and sound plan. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Brad Butler, followed by Trent Leon Nearmas. Brad's being unmuted. Brad? Hi, folks. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. Um, I want to echo the sentiment shared by several uh, folks that I know, lots of folks that I don't uh, tonight in support of complete streets in general. Um, and while I'm here on my own behalf tonight, I believe you either have recently received or will receive soon written testimony from the Owen Brown Village Association in support of the Complete Streets initiatives uh, uh, on, the, on the upcoming budget. Um, <clears throat> my own interest tonight is in support of Project K5066 um, with uh, also support for T7106 and J4222. Um, K5066 impacts me personally because I, I commute to work along Dobbin Road. Uh, it's unsafe. 
Um, I know it's unsafe, but I'm stubborn. I've um, communicated with county staff about that, and, and they're in agreement, and, and they've put some wonderful plans together to, to address that address that issue and help keep uh, folks who, who choose to commute by bike um, and pedestrians safe. In addition, that's going to connect uh, local businesses along Davin Road with the residential areas in Longreach and Owen Brown. And so that's a, a win-win situation to get that to get that project built. Um, so I want to I want to thank the county for the work and the funding that has already gone into the Complete Streets Initiative, and just encourage you to continue to prioritize these programs because they really do make a difference in our quality of life. Um, thank you very much. Have a great evening. Next up, we have Trent Leon Learman, followed by Isha Dora. Trent is not uh, present. And next up, we have Isha Dora. Isha is not present. Next up, we have Connie Serrano Portillo. One moment, please. Connie's been unmuted. Tony? Thank you so much. Um, good evening, Dr. Wall, members of the administration. My name is Connie Serrano. I am the Healthcare Research and Policy Analyst at CASA, the largest grassroots immigrant advocacy organization in the Mid Atlantic region. I am here today representing CASA and its members, residing in Howard County, to urge the county to invest $1 million to support the creation of a maternity partnership program in the county. In partnership with other organizations in the county, CASA has been working towards supporting an expansion of prenatal care services for uninsured women in Howard County. Mothers and their children should be protected through having affordable, accessible, and high quality care during such pivotal times. As you may know, many of these women do not qualify for federal programs such as Medicaid or the Affordable Care Act. This leaves expecting mothers with three options. One, not receive any care until they are, el until they are eligible for emergency Medicaid in the emergency rooms where they are ready, when they are ready to give birth. Two, pay out of pocket for services and three, leave the county to find affordable minimal care. Waiting until giving birth to see a doctor for the first time puts both mothers and children at a huge risk that could result in death. As most of these women would be eligible for Medicaid, if not for their immigration status, then it is clear that paying out of pocket for services is unrealistic. Lastly, leaving the county for services often requires mothers to spend the little money they have for appointments on transportation. In conclusion, none of these options are safe or feasible for mothers in Howard County. CASA has endless testimonies of mothers who have lost their children, who have had extremely complicated and traumatizing deliveries, or mothers who have had to give birth to children with severe health problems. This is alarming. We have an obligation to provide optimal outcomes for mothers and babies in Howard County. The 1 million of investment that the county would put into a prenatal care program is not only an investment in health equity, but an investment in the future of the county and its residents. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. Up next, we have Lewis Mayer followed by Jocelyn Whitfield. Lewis is not present. Up next, we have Jocelyn Whitfield. Jocelyn is not present. Uh, up next, we have Mark Berlingame. One moment, please. Mark has been unmuted. Mark? Mark, you're up. Okay. Next up, we have Justine Schaefer. Justine's not present. Up next, we have Shelby Thomas. Shelby is present. Unmuted. Shelby, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me out today. Today, I'm here in support of our request for financial backing for the Maternity Partnership Program. My name is Shelby Thomas. I am the Operations Director of um, Chase Braxton Healthcare, the only federally qualified healthcare center in Howard County. I have been with Chase for about three years. Currently, there is no reliable access to prenatal care for uninsured residents of Howard County. Chase Braxton Columbia location is our second largest location serving around 11,000 patients. 
Out of those 11,000 patients, more than half of those patients are uninsured or underinsured. Our healthcare center has been unable to expand our, our desperately needed prenatal services to our Howard County site despite this issue having been raised again and again and again for years beyond me being there because we do not have the community partnership to work with us to support this high risk underserved obstetristic population. A portion of our pregnant patients from Howard County, approximately over 206 patients per year, are able to access prenatal care by traveling out of the county to one of our other healthcare centers, either in Glen Burnie, Baltimore City, or Randallstown. But traveling out of the county comes with a heavy cost to this already underserved population. Travel is oftentimes impossible or exceedingly challenging and results in delayed care and missed prenatal appointments due to not being able to access those services. We have received feedback from some of the hospitals to which we refer our high-risk obstetristic patients to in other counties of Maryland that, could, that they can no longer accept our patients from Howard County because they do not have enough access for the patients within their own counties. Furthermore, a large portion of these patients ultimately choose to deliver at the closest hospital, which is Howard County General Hospital, and frequently present in labor, while the OB hospitalists have no or limited access to their prenatal records, increasing the risk of poor and costly outcome. As the operations director, I am unable to support our patients and our providers who are unable to care for our patients because the system is structured in such a way as to make it impossible for the most marginalized and sick patients. A program like the one bringing, being proposed would grant my patients one of their basic human rights, which is health care, and would maximize our chances of welcoming, welcoming healthy babies to Howard County. In my opinion, only then can Howard County live up to its US News and World Report 2021 ranking as one of the healthiest communities so I urge you to support this creation of the Maternity Partnership Program. Thank you for your consideration and thank you for allowing me to speak today. Okay, last up we have Grandma Swanson. One moment, please. Uh, Greta's not present. And with that, it com we conclude the testimony for tonight. I will put it back to the County Executive. I just want to thank everyone for your testimony. Uh, please know that not only I, but my team took uh, copious notes. I want to thank all of my team who continued to listen in on this thoughtful and important testimony. I want to especially thank our DTCS team who helped make the technology possible and helped ensure that we were all connected in a way that each and every one of our residents could be heard and empowered. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening.